Good afternoon. Today is February 15th, 2022, and welcome to the Ways and Means uh, hearings. We are going to start out with House Bill 707 with Chairman Barve. Well, uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. It's uh, good to be back in the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, I had eight glorious years there. I'd say 90% of the time, we had a wonderful time, and only 10% of the time were we struck by abject fear and panic and horror. I think it was about 10%. But, you know, I think with you at the helm, I'm sure it'll only be 9%. So that's- <laughs> Thank a, you. Yes, I thought you'd appreciate <laughs> that. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen of the Ways and Means Committee, House Bill 707 is something that many of you will recognize because I believe uh, you passed it three years ago and- uh, what the bill basically does, it's a constitutional amendment, and what it seeks to do is change the way that candidates for governor choose their running mates. Right now, the candidate for governor and lieutenant governor run together, they file together on a ballot, and then you know, they win and then they continue to serve. What I'd like to do is do it sort of the way that several other states have done it and the way we do it at the federal level. And that would be that the candidate running for governor would be on the ballot running for governor. And then after he or she wins the primary, they would have 21 days to choose their running mate. Now, what this does is it basically allows for both political parties to put together their best ticket. It means that, say, the first, the candidate who comes in first place wants to team up with the candidate who came in second place. Uh, this is an option that they would now be able to have. Another advantage to this, I believe, is that um, more people would actually run for governor knowing that they might have a chance of being selected as a lieutenant governor candidate. I, I, I know at least a couple of people who chose not to run for governor because they just didn't want to run and then kind of you know lose their place in the legislature. So I think that this would be um, a great thing for members of the House and Senate as well. And so um, that's really all I have to say about the bill. I, I would ask for a favorable motion and you would help me to fulfill my career-long ambition of passing at least one constitutional amendment. You'll do that for me, right, Madam Chair? Our best, Mr. Chair. <laughs> well, any questions? Anyway. Yeah. No questions? Were you going to say something else? I'm sorry. No, I was just going to, I couldn't remember if I'd emphasize that this, uh, this bill did pass a committee I, once at least and maybe twice. Okay, thank you. Okay, seeing no questions, thank you. We'll let you get back to running your committee. Okay, thank you very much, Madam Chair. You look great in that seat. Take thank care. you. Okay. House Bill 3, 635, sorry, Delegate Rogers, and whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, Chair Atterbury, Vice Chair Washington, and members of the Mighty Ways and Means Committee. For the record, I'm Delegate Mike Rogers, Legislative District 32, Anne Arundel County. I respectfully request a favorable report for House Bill 635. With the proposed amendment, this bill extends several exemptions for property tax to waterway improvement districts and shoreline erosion control districts, assessments in keeping with Anne Arundel County's longstanding practice. Anne Arundel County also currently extends property tax exemptions to special community benefit districts and will pursue local legislation under existing authority to continue the practice. The largest of the exemptions affected by this gap in state law is the exemption for disabled active duty service members, a disabled veteran, or sur surviving spouses of an individual who died in the line of duty. This bill will help the county to continue to provide relief to these individuals or those individuals. Um, I anticipate having a delegation letter for the committee on this Friday uh, when the delegation takes up, takes this up. And for these reasons, I respectfully request a favorable report on House Bill 635. And, and Madam Chair, congratulations on the new assignment. Thank you. Are there any questions for Delegate Rogers? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 635. Thank you, Delegate Rogers. Thank you. Delegate Branch, House Bill 642, whenever you're ready. 
Good afternoon, Chairwoman Atterbury, Vice Chair Washington, and colleagues of the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, for the record, I'm Delegate Chanel Branch, and I come to you today to ask for your support for House Bill 642, a Baltimore City Homestead Property Tax Credit Notice. This bill would require Baltimore City to mail a certain notice of the Homestead Property Tax Credit to eligible homeowners in Baltimore City, whose dwellings have increased by the value of more than 10%. Um, as you know, may know that the families in Baltimore are struggling to keep their property taxes, um, to keep up with their property taxes and are at risk of losing their homes due to tax sale. Uh, the Homestead Property Tax Credit is a recourse that would allow families to limit their tax burden, but countless homeowners simply aren't aware of the tax credit. Um, and in turn, they're forfeiting the opportunity for the financial assistance that they may desperately need. Uh, this bill will help by notifying Baltimore City homeowners of the tax credit whose property taxes have increased by more than 10 percent. And it will also help prevent homeowners from going into tax sale or foreclosure. And in turn, it will also help reduce the addition to the vacant properties that we have in Baltimore. Um, and therefore, I would just ask if you could please give me a favorable report for House Bill 642. Thank you. For Delegate Branch. Okay, seeing, oh, I see Delegate Barnes. Simply because she's my favorite delegate. <laughs> uh, I just have one question. Uh, roughly, how many homes uh, are affected that would uh, need to receive this type of notice? Do you know? I don't have the answer. So you'll get that for me? Yes. Thank you. Other questions? Go ahead. Go ahead, delegate. No, I was going to say that this bill was also um, it was in the mayor of the um, Baltimore City was also in support of this bill as well. And have you all received a uh, delegation letter on this? Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for delegate Branch? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 642. Thank you, Delegate Branch. I didn't have enough time to text the whole committee to tell them to put their hands up. <laughs> I was trying to prank you, but I didn't have enough time to do it. <laughs> okay, House Bill 680, Delegate Brooks. We haven't seen you in a couple of days. Welcome back. That's, that's right. You know, you know, I'm trying to paint squatters' rights. So, right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All righty. Uh, Chair Atterbury and uh, uh, Co Chair Washington, and members of the um, Ways and Means Committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of HB 680 as Baltimore County Property Tax Credit for Supermarkets. Uh, for the record, I'm Delegate Brooks. I represent the 10th Legislative District in, in, in Baltimore County. Uh, HB 680 provides a property tax credit for supermarkets located in a food desert retail incentive area. And the USDA defines a food desert as a low income tract where a substantial number of or substantial share of the residents do not have access to a supermarket or a large grocery store. Yeah. According to a study by Towson University in 2018, 64% of zip codes in Baltimore County are considered food desert and contains predominantly low-income and minority neighborhoods. While Baltimore County residents are able to acquire food, the fact is that they live in food deserts means that they do not have convenient access to fresh or nutritious food from retailers. More often than not, individuals and families living in food desert rely on prepackaged and processed foods, which are high in sugar, salt, and saturated fat. Uh, this kind of diet leads to health problems such as obesity, high cholesterol, heart disease, and more. Yeah, HB 680 will empower Baltimore County to combat its food desert by giving property tax incentives to grocery stores that open in these areas. This will give, <clears throat> this will give previously underserved communities access to healthier choices and improve quality of life outcomes. Additionally, a county <clears throat> health ranking and roadmap study found that food stores can improve perception, food access, neighbor satisfaction, and 
and mental health as well. Lastly, incentivizing grocery stores to open in predominantly low income and minority neighborhoods will boost the economy by pro providing jobs in areas where they are most needed. For those reasons, I request a favorable report and I'll entertain any questions. Thank you, Delegate Brooks. Sure. Delegate, ba Delegate Barnes has a question for you. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. One of my favorite delegates. Uh, oh, quit it, quit hold it. up now. <laughs> Everybody is your favorite delegate. Oh, I love it. Quit it, quit it, quit it some more. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I like the bill. Uh, Prince George's County is in the same similar situation as far as having uh, uh, food deserts and trying to attract quality grocers uh, to come to Prince George's County. Uh, looking at the bill, uh, would you mind if we had men? Uh, to add Prince George's County alongside of uh, Baltimore County. Oh, I oh, do you have? Don't you have that in Prince George's County already, a delegate? I don't think so. Oh, you don't. Oh, okay. All right. Let me. Uh, can Can I circle back to you on that one? Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Delegate Patterson. Thank you very much. Uh, Delegate Brooks, my question is comparable or similar to a uh, Delegate Barnes. In Charles County, we have, I think on the western side, a food desert, and mm -hmm. we're trying to attract businesses and support for this initiative. So be on the lookout for possibly an amendment request from the Charles County delegation. Okay, I certainly will. <laughs> that has been noted for the record, Delegate. <laughs> and you're one of my favorite delegates, too. Oh, thank you. That's very kind of you. <laughs> okay. Are there any more questions for Delegate Brooks? Okay. Seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 680. Thank you, Delegate Brooks. And thank House you, Madam Chair. Calling House Bill 683, Delegate Saab. Hello, Delegate Saab. Hello, Madam Chairman Atterbury. It does have a nice ring to thank it. Thank you. Um, Go Class 2014. Um, for the record, um, my name is Delegate Sitsab, representing Anne Arundel County, and um, also good afternoon to the uh, Ways and Means Committee um, and to the Vice Chairman. Uh, House Bill 683 is a straightforward bill. It's actually a cleanup from a bill that we passed last year. The Republican State Central Committee initially used to elect three members for five legislative districts. And last year, we amended the bill, or we, we uh, proposed a new bill, that it um, changed it from having um, us elect members from the legislative district to council district. Um, the, the issue with that that we bring in today is that the, the, um, the central committee initially with the five legislative districts um, was electing three members, which is uh, 12, 12 members plus one for the sub district. The council district, there's seven. So in effort to have, not to have an even number, we added an at-large seat. And um, I'd like to blame the Senate for this uh, oversight or mistake that they forgot to amend the, uh, or, or was an oversight actually on both our, on both, the, uh, both sides that the, um, we need to elect two representatives from each council district to come up with the number 14 plus the at-large. And currently the way the bill passed, it creates 22 members. So what we're trying to do is to change one number from three members uh, that represent the council district into two per council district. And we will hear this bill this weekend. I mean, I'm sorry, this week, this Friday in delegation. And I will follow with the letter of support delegation. And I also have a letter of support from the chairman of the Republican Central Committee, but he wasn't able to testify. But I can, I'll be happy to also send a letter of support from the Republican Central Committee. And with that, I ask the committee for a favorable report on House Bill 683. Thank you. Are there any questions for Delegate Saab? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Delegate Saab. And that concludes the testimony on House Bill 683. Thank you. House Bill 697, is Delegate Munoz with us? Yes, there you are, welcome. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you for having me this, e this afternoon. Um, I'm very proud this afternoon to present to you House Bill 697. Um, this is a really great bill that has received a vast amount of bipartisan support. 
um, in form of my, my wonderful co-sponsors. Um, and this will simply allow um, an extension of a property tax credit for disabled and fallen um, law enforcement officers and rescue workers in, in my county, in Anne Arundel County. Um, currently, if there is someone living in another county in Maryland and they want to move into Anne Arundel County, they're unable to bring their disabled tax credit, you know, that they've received and they've earned through the, you know, being disabled as a law enforcement officer on the job, they're not able to bring it into Anne Arundel County. So they're kind of tied down to their, their current residence and unable to move throughout the state. Um, and so this would simply allow them to take their tax credit with them, uh, move their family into Anne Arundel County, which we do have you know people who would like to do. Um, and that's what really prompted this bill. Um, not going to have a huge, you know, fiscal impact, um, but it will definitely help um, our law enforcement and rescue workers who've been disabled on the job, um, you know, live throughout Maryland and really give their families the, the best life that they can. So um, with that, it's very simple. Um, and I just ask a favorable report from this committee. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Delegate Munoz? We have to go through a training because when a new delegate comes to a committee, everyone is supposed to raise their hand and <laughs> like harass them. OK, people get on board. OK, well, no questions. Thank you, Delegate Munoz. Thank you so much. And that concludes the testimony on House Bill 697. Delegate Ivy, uh, I will call House Bill 483 whenever you're ready, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hold on. Uh, Vice Chair Washington, members of the committee. For the record, Delegate Julian Ivey presenting House Bill 483. Uh, this legislation continues the work of our local revenue subcommittee um, regarding uh, making the process for the homeowner uh, tax credit to be uh, more transparent and accessible. I've been working with Delegate Feldmark specifically, uh, who's pre presenting um, companion legislation. I'm looking forward to working on this bill. Uh, the goal of the legislation is to ensure that the owners of residential property who may be eligible uh, but fail to claim this tax credit are notified by mail uh, regarding how to apply for the homeowner's property tax credit. Uh, the legislation would not create an entirely new process, but instead uh, would direct SDAT uh, to include a new group in the mailing that—they already send out. As the program is currently designed, the comptroller and SDAT share information to identify and notify individuals who are potentially eligible for the tax credit. However, the current process does not include homeowners who are not required to file income taxes in the past three years. Uh, this bill would notify approximately half a million Marylanders of their eligibility uh, to this tax credit. Uh, these homeowners qualify for assistance uh, that they may not be aware of. And so I ask for a favorable report on House Bill 483. Look forward to continuing the work of this important issue with the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Delegate Ivy? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 483. Thank you, Delegate Ivy. Now calling House Bill 490, Delegate Cardin. Hi there, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, it's a pleasure to be back here on House Bill 490. Um, this bill, um, I, don't, I, I won't even look at my notes. This bill, um, you've heard this bill before, except I believe that the uh, chairman has not heard it before, um, would put uh, the, um, the campaign finance re uh, regulations for um, all of the sports betting um, uh, interested license holders in the same posture as gaming um, license holders. Basically, um, the way the bill was drafted, it's drafted the same as it was last year, which was that those that, that there was a prohibition against uh, li uh, gaming license holders from making political contributions. And this would put um, the sports betting folks in the same posture. As I'd already discussed with a number of you on the committee, and I tried, we did try to get to most of you, I don't really care. In fact, I would prefer to go the opposite way that everybody should be permitted to. But the fact is that both these entities should be treated the same for policy purposes. So that's the idea. Um, I, I believe that State Board of Elections is here for uh, any questions and can provide answers. I believe that the consistency between the two entities 
would make a, their their lives and their work much easier. And it just makes a whole lot of sense from a policy perspective. And the last thing I'll say, for those of you who weren't here back in, I think it was like 2007 or maybe 2008, when we passed the additional gaming license for, um, for Prince George's County's facility at MGM, um, it's at um, National Harbor. Um, there was a, basically the, the agreement was made. This was Lou Simmons, uh, former delegate Lou Simmons, put in the amendment to the bill requiring um, uh, um, or pro prohibiting license holders from making political contributions. It was very controversial. It failed the first time around 66 to 66. And then finally it passed 67, uh, 66 um, in a reconsideration vote in order to get the, um, the bill passed. Um, for, and the fact is that I am not sure that we should be treating these license holders any differently than any other industry and the other members of the general public of Maryland. However, if we're going to treat them differently, it should be consistent with all the different um, entities that do this kind of work. So that's that's the essence of the bill and I'm happy to take any questions, but I, I would hope that the state board can fill in if there's technical issues that I don't necessarily understand. Well, you do have a few questions, so we'll start with Delegate Wilkins. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and thank you, Delegate Cardin, for joining us today and for providing some um, information on this bill. Um, I do wonder about this bill in terms of um, why we're singling out this particular industry. Um, and I wanted to just understand more from you around why this particular industry um, would be prohibited and also how you would feel about adding additional industries to it, such as, um, let's say, liquor, health insurance, lawyers, and other industries as well. Right. Okay, great. So um, we made a policy decision, I don't know if it was 2008, 2007, to prohibit uh, license holder, gaming license holders from making political contributions. We did that as a legislature. I voted against it, by the way. Um, I was uh, adamantly argued against that amendment um, at the time. I thought it was not good policy. I happened to sit on Ways and Means at the time um, and was involved in campaign finance reform um, the most comprehensive campaign finance reform that Maryland had since then in the last 50 years. Um, that being said, um, we made a policy decision that those license holders should be banned. There is no question, I don't think in any of our minds, that sports betting and gaming are similarly situated types of industries, if, it, if not considered the same um, uh, to a certain extent. Look, I have no problem, if we're gonna do it, let's ban all political contributions. I'm fine with that. Ban lawyers, it save, it'll save me and my colleagues a lot of money. I'm fine with that um, if you wanna do that. I just think we need to be consistent. I prefer, like I said, let me make this very clear. I prefer the bill to have been drafted differently to say that everybody should be allowed to make political contributions. That means we take away the prohibition from the gaming license holders. That will not help me. I don't have any any relationships with those guys. It might help people in ways and means because you guys interact with those guys all the time. It could have, help other people. Who knows who it'll help and who it'll hurt. The point of the matter is, is that if we're going to ban it for gaming license holders, I and seeing kind of what has happened in the industry and the expectations that we were given two years ago when this whole thing started, and that over a hundred million people in the country legally um, uh, bet on the Super Bowl because of the the additional increase in sports bets all over the all over the country. I, I have all I'm saying is that I think from a policy perspective, I happen to just believe from a policy perspective that these industries ought to be treated equally in the same. I would prefer it if you would take this bill and make everybody legal to be able to give. That's, I think, the best policy, or make everybody illegal to be able to give and have no political contribution. Of course, that would violate the Constitution and issues with First Amendment. But that being said, um, that's that's my take. Yeah, quick uh, follow-up, Madam Chair. 
So yeah, I've heard you say several times in the testimony that it was bad policy to begin with and that you'd rather everyone be able to give. Um, is that an uh, amendment that you are able to submit to the committee or is there a reason why that isn't the bill that's in front of us since it's a bad it was, policy? Um, yeah. I'm curious why we would expand um, something that you've said several times as a bad well, policy. I think it becomes, first of all, I think it becomes a better policy if we treat like parties similarly. That would be bad policy if we didn't and we are not right now. So if this is better, then it, this bill is better than what the present situation is. However, um, I'm happy to draft that amendment. Uh, this is, this is it was drafted this way because I think it was just um, uh, easier for um, the drafters. I, I don't wanna put the blame on anybody in particular, um, but uh, it was easier for the drafters just to draft the same bill as last year. Thank you, Doug. I appreciate your, your indulgence. Um, yep. I, I'm just, curious about the narrowness of it, but thank you again. Michael. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I have kind of the same, I don't want to beat the dead horse. I think you've said, you know, I look at this as a perfect vehicle to do something, which since I joined this legislature and this committee, I honestly think is probably not constitutional. I think we might've had this discussion in the bill hearing before <clears throat> to single out one industry that has no particular track record or history of political corruption or manipulation, so to speak. Uh, and say you can't donate, but bail bondsmen can donate, opioid manufacturers can donate, a variety of other, you know, the liquor industry can donate, you can't donate. Uh, medical marijuana, medical cannabis producers can donate, but you can't donate because you're a casino. That might have made some sense in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, when casinos had a track record of being perhaps dominated by um, uh, some organized crime interests. But as we all know now, pretty sure all six of the casinos in the state of Maryland are all owned by publicly traded corporations whose uh, you know, leadership and stock disclosures and everything else are, are the same or more severe than any industry. So I appreciate, and I think take you at your word to say, this might be the vehicle to finally get rid of that. Uh, I don't think the casinos themselves have ever had a particular interest, as you mentioned, for lawyers. Why, why, you know, It'd be great if they said, well, lawyers and law firms can't donate money. All that does is in theory, save you money. You can say, boy, I'd really like to give to you. I really appreciate what you're doing for us down there in Annapolis, but I can't give you a nickel. Uh, so, you know, I, I intend, you know, with the committee's indulgence to think that maybe this is the vehicle to get rid of that. And so the logical consistency, everybody's the same. I agree with that. I just don't think that we can ban casinos or sports betting companies, uh, from, from donating, but people who own tracks can donate people who, you know, have a variety of other businesses can donate bingo parlors can donate the people who operate the large bingo halls, the, the pull tab machines in Maryland. So uh, I appreciate that. And maybe this is the year that we can use this legislation as a vehicle to get some uh, uniformity. I would, I would be honored if you use this, um, give this, this bill is now the committees. If you want to take it and I can help draft the amendment, I would be happy to. I will tell you that former delegate uh, Simmons was very, very, um, Articulate and uh, and very persuasive with his um, with his arguments about the fact that this industry should be singled out and it met constitutional muster. Um, I would side with you. I'm not sure that it I'm not sure that it violates uh, First Amendment, but I do believe that this industry has not proven itself to be at least in, in the night in the 2020s has not proven itself to be any more corrupt or inappropriate in terms of its actions uh, than many other industries. And so I would, I would prefer to, uh, to use this, uh, if, if it's this or any other bill, to make, it, uh, to make the, it consistent across the board. However, at the bare minimum, I think, it, I, I just, I think that any, for anybody to argue that sports books and um, gaming license holders should be treated differently is just not necessarily a, a, an argument that, that holds a lot of water. That being said, let's let's treat let's do exactly what you said, Delegate Buckle, and I'm happy to to help in whatever way I can. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Delegate Cardin? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 490. Calling House Bill 491, Delegate Cardin, whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, members of the committee. You've also heard this bill before. 
Um, and I did not, uh, you, 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 many of you heard the witnesses that I've had in the past, um, including my, my former attorney who helped me on this case. Um, but this bill authorizes the chair or the vice chair of the State Board of Elections um, in place of the Secretary of State to seek injunctive relief against any violation of state campaign finance laws under uh, Title 13 of the Election Law Article. Uh, basically, the Secretary of State is not the appropriate party to be doing this. Um, it should be the State Board of Elections who handles all the day-to-day -day, um, actions and all the legal matters. Um, and whereas the Secretary of State is more of a, a figure in the in the uh, carrying out of election law. Um, the bill also authorizes a candidate to seek injunctive relief. This is the little bit more controversial part, um, which, which is why I brought my witnesses in last year um, against any violation of those laws. Um, the person is required to file an independent expenditure electioneering communication report under the state uh, campaign finance law if a public communication or electioneering communication relates to the to the to the candidate. So basically that the candidate can file directly. Um, and the example that I have given in the past is that um, when I was I was at one point running for office, there was a um, an independent expenditure group that had, used um, uh, money to to uh, to uh, run ads and other things against my campaign. Um, we were just seeking their financial disclosure, which was required to see what was going on, and they refused to file it. So we filed injunctive relief. Luckily, before um, about 20 minutes before the hearing was set, um, the thing, it was filed, it became moot, and the hearing was canceled. However, and Nobody got in any trouble. There was, there was everything. Everything was fine. Um, however, um, had the hearing proceeded, the judge could have um, simply dismissed it because I was not the party permitted to file for injunctive relief. It would have had to been the Secretary of State, which makes absolutely no sense because Secretary of State had no understanding of any of this. It could have been either the State Board of Elections administrator or me. Um, so, it, and and one of the questions that somebody is probably not going to ask but could ask. Is, is doesn't this open up the the world to trying to run campaigns through um, legal actions and stopping people from doing things like um, you know like sending out brochures or leaflets or whatever? And the answer is to file one of these in, um, uh, to file one of these actions for injunctive relief costs thousands and thousands of dollars. I can tell you from personal experience, and I try to do it on the cheap and um, get pro bono uh, or get uh, help from somebody who was willing to, to provide, um, to provide uh, services um, in kind. And it still cost us about $3,500 to $4,000 to file the, um, the, uh, the injunctive relief. And so people are not going to use this as a campaign tool. This is really um, to try and stop bad behavior. Thank you very much. Any questions for Delegate Cardin? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Delegate Cardin. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 491. House Bill 704, Delegate Buckle. You're on mute. Let me hit my unmute button there. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. House Bill 704 relates to the Homeowners Property Tax Credit Program. The Homeowners Property Tax Credit Program is a program funded with state revenues that provides um, uh, credits or, or breaks or helps to finance the payment of property taxes for uh, individuals who have particular economically disadvantaged needs. And there's a variety of uh, limitations to the program so that generally people, the, the, the assessed value of the property has to be less than $300,000. And what this bill particularly relates to is many years ago when this program was created, they had a, a limitation that says that the homeowner, which can be multiple people, obviously could be a, a married couple. It could be multiple interfamily, intergenerational individuals who live in the home and, and are owners of the home, uh, such as, you know, a grandmother and a grandchild, a, a single parent, maybe a widowed parent and, and two children uh, or a child and a spouse, they have to have a combined net worth of less than $200,000 in order to qualify for the program. So combined net worth, which excludes the equity in the home itself, 
at a combined net worth of less than $200,000. This bill would increase that to $600,000. And I'm certainly happy if there's some middle ground that could be accommodated. Why is that? It's called inflation. When the bill was created, uh, having a combined net worth of $200,000 or more was viewed as generally being upper middle class, having real retirement savings, having assets. I think all of us now could assume that you know, you could have uh, a, a working individual. They also have income requirements, yearly income requirements. I believe it's less than 60000 You could have someone who is a starting out school teacher uh, who works in some of our, our communities who maybe makes forty five or fifty or $55,000, uh, maybe works in, in a variety of other fields starting out. And that individual lives with their retired parent, perhaps is, is a widower or has some disability that has no income. But that parent may have a net worth of $175,000. That parent may be in their 50s or 60s or 70s, which is not a lot of money for retirement savings. They may have a very small overall retirement account, uh, some other assets. And simply because uh, their, their child or their, their family member, their intergenerational relationship uh, is now a potential co-owner of the property, they can't get the property tax credit anymore. $200,000 30 years ago, uh, is not what $200,000 is today for net worth. Uh, this situation has occurred. I, I know it's occurred in my jurisdiction, uh, which is not a, a terribly uh, uh, higher income jurisdiction. There are pockets of it, but there are pockets of very much below the median income. It's also occurred, in, and we've had you know some information and testimony about it or some, some indications given to us in places like Baltimore City, where you have folks who say, you know, my, my grandfather owned a row home, uh, it was protected under this policy. My grandfather passed away. I moved in with grandma or an aunt or whoever it is. They put my name on it so as to, to provide us some protection. If someone should ever have to go to a nursing home, that, that I'm, my name's on the house. And it turns out now I get an investigation or I have to sign a certification that says my net worth is below 200000 I have 185000 I've worked for 20 years. I have $185,000 in a 401k. Or, or some other pension program. I'm not rich. That's never going to pay for my long-term retirement. <clears throat> but as a result, our property tax bill goes up substantially and, and helps to price us out of the home. And so this is designed to, to fix this. That's all it would do. <clears throat> there would be, if the committee chooses to proceed with it, we would have to offer an amendment in, uh, in the subcommittee that would move the effective date back by a year uh, and so that it wouldn't take effect until 2023 because of how SDAT calculates the, uh, the taxes, and we can do that, I would do that if it's brought up at the subcommittee level. <clears throat> but it's basically just the realities of inflation, that $200,000 that we set in law many, many, many years ago uh, now is, is kicking an awful lot of uh, uh, lower middle class and working families out of the program. Thank you. Mark has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Delegate, for this bill. And I, I appreciate the, the focus on um, updating these dollar amounts that we've set in statute and um, time has passed. I guess my, my question is, uh, why focus on the updating the net worth and not the income? Because because sixty thousand dollars is not what it was sure. twenty years ago either. Sure. So I'm just curious if you considered that and why you chose yeah. one, not the other. I, I think you could potentially do both. I mean, I, you know, to, to play devil's advocate on the other side of the argument, there are many communities where sixty thousand dollars in income. Now, if it's a two earner family, I mean, sixty thousand dollars is is literally nothing. Uh, if it's a single earner, you know, single working individual, and that's kind of what the focus was: is these intergenerational relationships where people move in with their elderly parents or grandparents or something of that nature. And the fact that they may have some really moderate minor net worth through a retirement savings program of their own, then kicks their, their elderly parent or kicks the whole house out. Uh, I could live with either, either one or both, certainly. Uh, the $60,000 mark, you know, in my community, if you were a single earner and you made $60,000 a year, you're middle class. Uh, you're not substantially middle class, but you're middle class. But, but that really was the focus is these instances that were brought to my attention of we didn't really change our finances. I just moved in with mom or I moved in with grandma or I moved in with my great aunt who's you know diabetic and can't get out of the house. 
I'm not rich either, but I did have $150,000, $250,000 in a retirement account. I'm in my 40s or 50s. And now the next year, as that tells us that our property taxes went up $2,000 a year and we can't, we can't afford it. So that was kind of the impetus was the net worth is, is a little bit more reflective of those uh, family situations as opposed to just individuals. Delegate Long, do you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Delegate Buckle, for bringing this bill. It's a good bill. Uh, we've been looking to raise um, these caps for a while. Uh, I believe it was night. Well, anyway, um, you run into incidences where there's uh, like mothers and uh, let's say mothers living with their children that their gross income is over sixty thousand dollars. Do you run into that? Yeah, I think that's, you know, and, it, and it's, it's similar to what Delegate Feldmark just expressed. I think that happens too. Uh, I think it's a little bit harder maybe sometimes because the, the median income <clears throat> really is different in different parts of the state. So the median household income in Howard County is much different than what it is in Somerset County. Uh, but yet in terms of long-term retirement savings and net worth statistics, they're a little bit easier, but uh, you know, I, I would be happy again that this becomes the product of other people's thoughts as well. That if you know, if we'd like to amend that up from sixty thousand to you know a, a natural number seventy five thousand something in that respect, or maybe change it to say if it's sixty thousand, if it's still a single earner, but if it's a multiple earner household, you know, multiple filer household, maybe you, you bump that up to, to eighty or seventy five or somewhere in that range. It would serve the same purpose. The main goal is this, we've, we've set these numbers, whether it be 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and as the cost of everything, including the assessments of sometimes the homes go up, people have to pay more in, in housing. These aren't incredibly wealthy homes. Where I live, a house less than, you know, $290,000 house is a pretty nice house assessed. Right. Uh, but in a lot of communities in our state, you know, a $250,000 house is extremely middle class, if that. Uh, and you have people who are getting priced out of this program simply because they've got some intergenerational living arrangements where someone has a very modest savings account or retirement savings account and it prices them out. So we'd like to try to fix that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Representative Testimony on House Bill 704. House Bill 480, Delegate Long, and I see you have one witness. So whenever you're ready, Delegate Long. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to make sure I took the mute button off. <laughs> um, Delegate, for the record, Delegate Bob Long here to testify on HB 480, Homestead Property Tax Credit, Calculation of Credit of Dwelling Purchased by a First-Time Home Buyer. What this would do would um, help first-time home buyers uh, on their property taxes, instead of them getting hit uh, for the full assessment after the uh, reassessment cycle, this would uh, give them a uh, comfort or a, a buffer. It would go up 20% a year over a five year period. And finally, it would come up to 100%. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, I'm a real estate broker and I do enjoy working with people, getting them in their first homes. Um, you know, first time home buyers, they put everything into it just to get a down payment. And a lot of times, you know, we want to, uh, a lot of times they run into difficulties and they, we don't want to see no one lose their home. Um, and if you take a home, it was a uh, property tax assessment back, let's say the homeowner was there 25 years and uh, they sell it after 25 years, their property taxes could possibly double once new owners take over. And that's what this is for is to, uh, give it the new homeowners a cushion for that. Um, you know, we, we can build intergenerational wealth, uh, getting first time home buyers. It, you know, if somebody owns a home, they have skin in the game, they take better care of the house, it's good for the neighborhoods. You know, everyone should have an opportunity to buy a home. I mean, it's a great investment. I, there are some people that I've known from dealing with real estate that don't wanna own a home, but there's a lot to do. But unfortunately they're, you know, they're, they're scraping bottom just to get a down payment. And we want to do whatever we can to help first time home buyers get into that first home. I know how hard it was for me when I bought my first home. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I would ask for a favorable vote on this. And let's give the first time home buyers a chance to 
become first time home buyers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And next for two minutes, please, Kevin Canale. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman, members of the committee. Kevin Canale here on behalf of the Maryland Association of Counties in opposition to House Bill 480. Counties oppose this bill because it compromises the basic nature of the homestead property tax credit, which is to keep stability for people who buy their homes after the time of purchase. So the whole purpose is we want to make sure that people can stay in their homes after, after they purchase the home. It's not to be transferred to new homeowners. So it jeopardizes the basic purpose of the credit. Um, also, this bill definitely has a fiscal note. I will say that if you look at the fiscal note, this, this bill would result in millions of dollars lost in, in local revenues, and that's money that goes to schools, public safety, public health, all the things that we do every single day that benefit our share constituents. And I do also want to point out that this bill's fiscal note is based on one year of sales data. Several factors can impact the year-to-year -year revenue effect of the bill. And for example, the fiscal note for House Bill 1445 of 2018 which is an earlier introduction of this bill, uh, the, the projected local property tax revenue loss was 85 million by fiscal year 2023. So with that, Madam Chair, we, we just think that this bill subverts the main policy goal of this longstanding and successful homeowner program and would cost counties millions of dollars in revenue needed for essential local services. If we want to provide uh, everything that the delegates said, I agree, there, there are a lot of benefits to homeownership, but this is just the wrong way to do it. And for that reason, we'd ask for an unfavorable report. Madam Chair. Delegate. Yes, just want something? to point out, point out this is enabling legislation. Um, you know, the counties can choose to use it if they want to. Uh, they don't have to. Um, I just think it's another tool in the toolbox uh, for counties. Some of our more uh, larger counties could probably use it a whole lot more. And there's some smaller counties that probably cannot afford this. And that's why it's enabling legislation. Um, and I agree with you. We do need to um, watch, you know, watch our piece, watch, watch what we spend. I agree with you on that. Um, but this is enabling legislation. And, you know, anything we can do to help first time home buyers get into a, to a house, you know, that's what it's all about. Plus, I can go to work and make some money. Thanks. <laughs> Are there any questions for Delegate Long or for uh, Mr. Canale? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 480. Delegate Hartman, House Bill 677, and Mr. Canale will be up again right after you. So whenever you're ready. I don't know if that's good news or not to hear that Kevin's coming back. But uh, anyway, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the Ways and Means Committee. For the record, I am Delegate Wayne Hartman. Here with House Bill 677, the Homestead Property Tax Credit, portability of value of that tax credit to the new dwelling. So the premise behind this is to keep Marylanders in Marylanders, in, keep Marylanders in Maryland. If you are moving from a previous Maryland homestead to a new homestead in Maryland, you will be able to transfer your homestead assessment difference. So portability allows homestead owners to transfer their benefit from their old hem, homestead to a new homestead lowering the tax assessment and consequently, consequently the taxes for the new homestead. So what does this mean? So if you own a home in Maryland enjoy a, and presently enjoy a homestead tax credit, that credit or difference of your assessment and the amount you pay tax on because of the homestead tax credit, that could be moved to your new residence, reducing the tax on the new home and encouraging folks to stay in Maryland. It allows our empty nesters or retirees to downsize and not lose the benefit of the homestead tax credit. So for example, if you have a house that has an assessed value of $300,000 and you're only paying tax on 200,000 because the amount of time you've been in the house and the fact that you have a, a, a large homestead tax credit, this is probably an extreme case, but the math was easy. So a $300,000 assessment, $200,000, which you're paying, tax on, you have a $100,000 credit or a 33% reduction. So the idea would be to allow um, someone to move within Maryland and take that percentage or that, that credit with them. Now, um, SDAT had a little heartburn with the bill. There are a few amendments to um, that are easy fixes. Um, one thing is um, when when you move, you would have to reapply for the homestead tax credit. So very simply, you can have a, add a line to the form 
which would ask if you're moving from a, a currently a, reside in Maryland or moving from a Maryland home and what that address was. Um, that, that provides that fix for, for SDAT as far as tracking. Um, originally, the bill allowed, um, if there was two owners, maybe to split the amount of credit if they're moving separate ways to simplify things and, and ultimately lessen the fiscal note, um, we have an amendment that would strike that. Uh, we also have an amendment to make the effective year 2023. And um, I think that about that about cleans it up. So the um, the idea came to me from one of my constituents. It's, um, you know, if you look to um, our neighboring states, the amount of, of, of growth and development is just tremendous. And uh, this is this is definitely a way we need to find some type of middle ground to keep uh, to keep our Maryland residents here, allow them to downsize and not be penalized um, by moving. So that about covers if anybody has any questions. Well, you do have another witness. Um, so Kevin Canale for two minutes. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman, members of the committee. Kevin Canale on behalf of the Maryland Association of Counties in opposition to House Bill 677. I do appreciate chatting with the delegate and the sponsor about this bill, and I certainly appreciate the amendments to clean up some of the, the tracking issues that, that could be uh, could result from this bill. However, for, for a lot of the reasons I just talked about, um, we, we oppose this bill because we don't think this is the right venue to grant the kind of benefits that the delegate is seeking to grant, which are admirable. We certainly agree that it, it behooves all of us to keep Marylanders in Maryland if they're moving. Um, under current law, the, the Homestead Property Tax Credit uh, it's capped at 10% per year in, in terms of what your assessments can rise. And nearly every county has exercised their authority to lower that cap. And again, that's designed to keep people from rising assessments. So making this, this credit portable certainly would, would cause revenue issues for us. The, the fiscal note comes in at about $48 million. I agree with the delegate that maybe some of the, the amendments that address the tracking issues could lessen that note. But again, there's a lot of unpredictability here in terms of what this could mean for local revenues. We're happy to work with the committee and with the sponsor to come up with ways that we can keep Marylanders here in Maryland and provide those kind of benefits. But again, we just don't think the homestead credit is the way to do it. And for those reasons, we'd ask for an unfavorable report. Delegate Long. You're on mute. Yes, I just wanted to ask a question. He did say something about downsizing, and I find that interesting because it's possible if you've been in your primary residence for 30 years and you're getting a homestead property tax credit and your taxes are based for 30 years, and like myself, if I wanted to downsize into another home, if I went out and bought another home, I would have to pay the full assess of that property value. And, you know, people retiring on fixed incomes, it could possibly uh, uh, hinder them from retiring, if you think about it, because it, let's just say, for instance, for, for uh, you know, I sell my house for $500,000, but yet I want to buy a condo and it's, uh, you know, $600,000, let's say it's an even trade, but my property taxes want to jump up, it could almost double. So, you know, I think it's a good bill and, um, you know, thank you. Would, would you? <laughs> I'll get long. I mean, how do you feel about that, Delegate Hartman? I mean, am I surmising that correctly? No, I agree. That's absolutely the purpose of it. It, um, you know, people have been in their home a long time. And in, in response to what um, Kevin had said, if if people are moving to a county with a higher, like a 10% cap, that credit is going to be eaten up more quickly and it's not going to be given to them over the course of many years. So if someone's in a county with a, a, a lower cap already, 3%, or I think Talbot County is only one with a 0%, um, I, I would think people would stay within those counties as opposed to moving to a county with a with a higher. So it's, it's, it's not going to have as much impact on some of the counties that may have concern, the more aggressive counties in the taxing. But if someone does for reasons of moving closer to their family or something for help as they age or whatever, and um, that 10% that cap is going to eat up that credit more quickly. And within a few years, um, that, that, that credit would be diminished anyway. So it's just helping to encourage Marylanders to stay in Maryland. I really think we need to take a look at this seriously. And um, th this, this bill, I think, is a good way to do it. I would appreciate a, a, a favorable um, 
outcome. Thank you. And that concludes the testimony on House Bill 677. House Bill 702, Delegate Hill. And I see there's one witness who will have two minutes. So Delegate Hill. Thank you very much, Madam. Oops, Delegate Hill. Um, good afternoon. And good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair and committee members. Can you not hear Going in and out. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Is this any better? I'm going to get really close. Hi, everybody. Okay. Let's try. I'm not sure what the problem is, but let me address it. Anyway, good afternoon. <laughs> um, again, for the record, I'm Delegate Terry Hill, and I'm coming before you with H HB 702. Uh, a bill that you all passed last year, and it passed the House, but in the Senate it was stopped, and uh, Delegate Guyton and I, uh, who uh, had the scenes that you, we're losing you, this year that Okay, I think we've lost you, Delegate Hill. If we again, I think we've we've lost right. you. I'm going to change to an. Okay, I'm okay. I'm going to another device. Um, okay. All right. I'll let I'm going to another, I'm going to another <laughs> device. Let me okay. in the other room. Let the witness speak and let me join the other room. Okay. Okay, Miss Barry, you can go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the, the committee. My name is Catherine Berry. I'm here representing the Maryland Association of Election Officials. Um, I'm here in support with amendments of House Bill 702. Essentially, this bill would codify some of the practices that we already do uh, with election judge training and business practices as it pertains to managing voters in lines who need assistance. The one friendly amendment that we would like to request is to remove the language that is specific to the size of the sign and also to allow flexibility for the State Board of Elections to establish the appropriate language for a sign. In addition, instead of providing specifics about where the sign needs to be placed specifically, we would just request that it be required to be visible and posted, um, allowing us some flexibility because polling place Building layouts and line structures are all different. And with that being said, if anyone has any questions, please uh, feel free to reach out, but we will continue to work with Delegate Hill on, on this bill. So thank you for bringing this bill up. Delegate Hill, let's see, are you ready? Is she back in here? Can you hear me now and see me? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much. And I apologize for the technical uh, issue. So uh, this bill 702 passed this committee uh, combined with another bill. And then, uh, but there, it got stopped in the Senate. And from a strategic standpoint, we pulled it back away from the other bill, hoping to get it passed. Uh, simply, as, as you heard from the other witness, this bill would require that election judges are trained on all the available accommodations. And with an amendment that I'm offering, it would, it would um, ensure that the local election site, the polling location, have a sign that describes what is available at that location, not as it's written that the state would have a sign that lists every possible a voting accommodation, and that uh, that would allow for the election judges at that site and the voters themselves to know what accommodations are available so they won't be surprised and they actually know what to ask for. Um, it would not be uh, prescriptive as to the type of accommodations that would be offered and the local boards and, and election judges could make that decision, but it required that the information be uh, posted the previous witness had asked if we could be less prescriptive about the size of the sign. And I think we can certainly discuss that, but we want to be sure that it's seen by the voters as they're coming to the location and as they're actually entering the room. And that's both for the person requiring accommodations, 
uh, and for the people who may see someone receive an accommodation and not know why they're receiving that and, and they aren't. Um, and so I'd ask for a favorable report. I would, again, um, just add um, one, one other item. Um, that is that, you know, in some cases, and the reason for this bill is I've seen places where voters were allowed to come in and sit and hold their place in line because they, need, they were elderly. I've seen places where voters were actually put towards the front of the line. And I've seen places where ballots were brought out to the car. Those are all wonderful accommodations, but the people in line didn't always understand. And some of the people who needed it didn't know what they could ask for. So this is, is a, a, about transparency and making sure that if we're making accommodations, voters know what they are. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Delegate Hill or Catherine Berry? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 702. Moving to House Bill 509, Delegate Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, members of the Ways and Means Committee. I'm here today on this bill dealing with property liens and tax sales and water bills because two doors down from me in my district, the Forest Park Senior Center was almost sold at tax sale because of an exorbitant uh, water bill. There's fault on both sides. The, the senior center was not aware and didn't act promptly, but yet it was totally exorbitant cost on the water bill because nobody was using the facility because of COVID. So there was no expectation that there was gonna be such a bill. Um, this is a system, the water system is one that the city has made some improvements, but I would submit based on the conversation, this instance, as well as the conversations I've had with people who deal with the system on a daily basis or frequent basis, that more needs to be done. Uh, people are not aware of the appeal process that the city has established. And although the city has, uh, written testimony in opposition. I don't know if they're speaking. I would ask uh, the committee to defer any action on this bill uh, so that the interested parties can get an opportunity to discuss the flaws in the existing system to see if there are some improvements uh, that can be made uh, so that I think everyone would agree with the goal that is you shouldn't lose your property. Now this bill speaks only uh, to uh, nonprofits of a certain size, but the problem goes beyond nonprofits uh, with regard to the water system, the water billing system. And we need to do more to protect the little guy or gal who owns property, but everybody uh, who owns property so that you don't go to the, the risk of the tax sale uh, and the additional cost because of a, a, a an exorbitant and inaccurate water bill. So for those reasons, I guess I would urge no report at this time so that uh, uh, hopefully favorable with amendments at some point so that we can get a chance to work on this and come back to the committee, hopefully with an amendment. Thank you. Questions for Delegate Rosenberg. Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 509. Delegate Rosenberg, House Bill 554. And this one, there is another witness signed up after you on this one. Right, is that Professor Gibson? Um, no, Danielle Charles. Okay. All right, well, Professor Gibson submitted written testimony. I hope you can make no, an no, I don't see it. Okay. You might wanna let him know to do that if he wants to. Okay. Um, I'm often accused of getting my bill ideas from the New York Times. You might think that in this instance, if you had watched MSNBC last night, that I got the idea from this bill from reading, uh, from listening to their account of the first day of early voting in Texas. But this bill, of course, was drafted and introduced uh, beforehand, but uh, before yesterday, obviously. But to listen to the obscure rules that prevented people from voting early in Texas uh, gave me pause because 
at the suggestion of Professor Gibson, Larry Gibson, uh, who was the mock professor of law at UM Law, law School and teaches the election law course, uh, he made, he brought to my attention a court of appeals ruling interpreting our existing law that makes it too likely to T-O-O, -O, too likely that people's names on a petition uh, are going to be stricken. Uh, as legislators, we're not big fans, being very frank, of petitions, of petitioning our bills to referendum, uh, or of a petition seeking to add a third party to the ballot. But I think simple fairness says that someone should not, someone's signature should not be thrown out uh, because they got their middle initial, they signed with their middle initial on a petition, whereas they had their full name, their full middle name on their, uh, on their voter registration. That not could be, I believe, my understanding is that would be grounds for that signature being invalidated. And this is coming from someone who might know because uh, my birth name is Samuel Isidore Rosenberg. I was the third Samuel of my generation, named after the same immigrant grandfather. Uh, and before I left the hospital, my mother related to me, I was Sandy, uh, because there were two Samuels before me. And then just prior, well, a little before I first ran, I had my name changed, because everybody knew me as Sandy. So my name is now Samuel Isidore, quote, Sandy, close quote, Rosenberg. You can bet that if I had signed a petition, it's very likely that I would have signed it incorrectly uh, under this law, under the existing law. And that's something I think that just decent fairness uh, says we should change. Under the existing law and the Court of Appeals decision, if you have submitted one name improperly, you can't make good with a second uh, with your name being listed uh, properly on the second uh, time that you sign a petition uh, document. Uh, those are the, the principal reasons why uh, I think we need to really review the existing law. And uh, I would certainly, I think I can offer for the subcommittee, the services of uh, Professor Gibson, uh, if that is possible because he knows this law far better than I do. But we should not be comparable to the state of Texas uh, when it comes to our election laws and providing access uh, to the political, pro to the electoral process. So for those reasons, I, I urge the committee to give a favorable report uh, to this bill. Thank you. Oh, one last thing, if you sign your name one way on the petition and then print it, a different way because you got to do it both ways. That is also grounds for throwing your your petition out. Uh, you can't even if you get it right once, if you get it wrong the second time on the same petition, you're out. Thank you. Um, the test um, written testimony from Professor Gibson. It was not he he um, didn't put the bill number on there, so it's not on. Um, the chart I'm looking at, but we'll make sure it gets to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, Danielle Charles for two minutes, please. Good evening. My, good afternoon. I'm Danielle Charles. I'm a Gold Star wife, and I am speaking in reference to House Bill 617. I am the surviving spouse of senior Wait, airman. I'm sorry, not, not to cut you off. We are on bill, House Bill 554. I was wondering, you called my name. I saw House Bill 5909 up there, but because you called me, I responded. Oh, well, you I, are I, listed. You did sign up to testify on this bill. If you don't want to, that's fine. Um, I apologize. I It may have been an error when I was trying to Okay. Get into the system. So I apologize. Sorry. No worries. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for uh, Delegate Rosenberg? 
Okay, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 554. Calling House Bill 538, Delegate Rosenberg again, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this bill as introduced uh, would add sec the Sunday before election day uh, to early voting, uh, souls to the polls. Uh, but it would also add three days as introduced to early voting. And I realized perhaps a week ago when I was working on my testimony that we could uh, eliminate the adi any additional cost by changing the start date for early voting to two Sundays before uh, election day, which is what the amendment that I have proposed and I believe has been circulated, what that amendment would do. Um, so the bill as amended, as I propose to amend it, uh, early voting would run from Sunday to Sunday. So it'd still be eight days, thereby, uh, I believe, eliminating the cost uh, for local jurisdictions. And I've been in conversation with Mike San Michael Sanderson about that. Um, and on the merits, I think having more opportunity to vote on the weekend uh, when far more people are not working would be would further our goals uh, in our election law over the last several years to expand the opportunity uh, for people to vote, uh, to give them different options. And with this amendment, uh, it's my understanding that we could do that without incurring uh, the additional cost for sure of three extra days uh, of early voting. Uh, and um, so, and I would add, this bill would not take effect until January 1. So this bill would have no effect uh, on uh, the elections this, uh, this year. And thus there would be more than two years time uh, for all involved to adjust to, uh, to make the adjustment from early voting on a Sunday and election day itself being 48 hours or even less than 48 hours later. So as amended, I would urge a favorable vote on the bill. Thank you. Thank you. And um, testifying unfavorably, Kevin Canale for two minutes. Uh, Madam Chair, Kevin Canale here on behalf of the Maryland Association of Counties. As amended, MAKO would drop its opposition to this bill. We appreciate the delegate uh, recognizing that the potential costs that would be incurred to, to provide additional three days for early voting. So we urge the committee to, to take the bill with the amendment and MAKO would drop its opposition on the bill as amended. And thank you. We have Catherine Berry for uh, testing as informational. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. Again, Catherine Berry, representing the Maryland Association of Election Officials. I just wanted to provide some comments about um, this bill that would, with the amendment, end early voting on the Sunday before election day. Currently, with the electronic poll books, there are technical components to preparing them for election day in order to ensure that voters are not able to come in on election day and, um, and vote again if they voted at early voting. So generally speaking, to prepare the electronic poll books, it takes about 48 hours for us to be able to touch every poll book that we have, get the update taken care of, and then subsequently get them the, the poll books out to all of the polling locations and get the polling places um, all organized and set up by the Monday night before. Of course, I can suggest though that in, in uh, Maryland in 2020, we instituted vote centers and some of the electronic poll book technical components that we have with ending early voting and then having a separate election day could be taken away by doing uh, instituting vote centers. Um, and th there's a lot of benefits with that, including you know, eliminating the voter confusion and um, streamlining some of our processes and requiring less 
um, electronic poll books that would need either need to be updated or, or something of that nature. So um, just with those comments in mind, um, I, I'm able to answer any questions that the committee may have. And uh, Delegate Buckle has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just for the sponsor, I think you did a really good job of explaining the potential amendment that would switch. You know, I took my little notes and I said, probably against it. It's adding all these additional days of early voting that we already have some of the broadest early voting in America. Uh, but then you, you explained. So I just want to get clear. This wouldn't actually your proposed amendment wouldn't add any days of early voting. It would simply shift them in a time period closer to actual election day which I had to be honest, has always been one of my concerns with early voting is you keep stretching it out and out in front. Some people are voting and then things happen, whether it be additional campaign activity, whether it be the revelation of certain instant, whatever it may be, you know, someone says, oh, gee, you know, a week before the election, I found something out about Joe Blow that makes me think I wouldn't want to vote for them, but I already voted for them because you know, I vote party line, whatever it is. And I, I went early voting four weeks before the election, three weeks for the election. So your amendment, Delegate Rosenberg, we'd have the same number of days. So, so we wouldn't be adding early voting per se. It would have the call, it would have a net cost limited effect uh, based upon Mako's testimony and the other places because they wouldn't have to staff for more days. And it would actually move the window of when people are making their choices through early voting, it would move it closer to election day. You, you have described the bill very well. You were taught well. Great. Yes, you and, and Professor Gibson. I took classes in Maryland from Larry Gibson as well. So thank you. Thank you for that uh, clarification. Delegate Wilkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thanks so much, Delegate, for bringing this, this thoughtful bill. Mm -hmm. I um, was just wondering if there was any comment from either the state or the local Board of Elections regarding the idea of Sunday to Sunday, any impact um, that they could share. So I think the original bill it was different dates. So I just wanted to hear their thoughts on Sunday to Sunday. So thank you, Delegate Wilkins. Um, the number of days for us, we will do whatever the General Assembly wants. Our concern is just that technical component of how the electronic poll books um, function between election day and early voting. Um, so I would defer that technical component to the State Board of Elections because it's the, you know, we follow their procedures. And, uh, well, thank you for the question, uh, Delegate. Uh, I would say that, uh, yes, you know, if, if the days shift, we would implement it uh, for the voters. We make sure that the voters would be aware of this. And I know that there is a currently a, a poll book procurement undergoing right now uh, to update uh, uh, with new technology for the poll books uh, on that. But I, so I, I don't know if there's any technical concerns that would be need to address with the new poll books or not due to this legislation, but I can find out and check with you on that. Okay, are there any other questions for the delegate or any of the other witnesses? Okay, seeing none, Delegate Buckle, you can take your hand down. Uh, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 538. And oh, you must have been preparing because Delegate Buckle, House Bill 497, and there's two folks uh, in it um, signed up to testify after you. So they'll have two minutes. So whenever Thank you're ready. You. Thank you, Madam Chair. House Bill 497 would exempt from the vehicle excise tax. Uh, a vehicle that was formerly titled and registered in another state by a member of the United States, we'll call it uniform services. It's essentially the military, but uh, also expands to a few other uniformed individual that, you know, when I was a kid, we were taught it's the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. But we know that there's a lot more individuals in our, in our federal service who are part of the uniform services. Uh, it would exempt those individuals from paying that vehicle excise tax if they bring their vehicle back to the state of Maryland, if they were on act, if they are on active duty, or they're returning to the state from active duty in another location, uh, it's a very simple and and frankly small bill in terms of its overall impact. But it's meaningful for many members of the United States Armed Forces and, and our uniformed services. The vehicle excise tax, for example, if they bought a vehicle, they were stationed in maybe Georgia, and let's just say, for example, Georgia had a two or three percent excise tax. 
they purchase the vehicle there, they choose to get it titled there because they're going to be in Georgia, you know, they know for the next 12 or 18 months, uh, and they don't have an opportunity to really go through the, the bureaucracy to get it back entitled in Maryland. And then they return home, they return home to our community, or perhaps they get assigned to our community. Uh, and they find out if they want to bring the car into Maryland and the registration expires, so they have to get it re-registered, -re they'll now have to pay an, ex uh, uh, an additional excise tax because of the differences between our states and other states' as excise tax. This bill would simply exempt those limited individuals from having to pay that additional tax that they otherwise really wouldn't incur, you know, that they're, they're moved all around uh, as a result of their own service. We want them to, to like Maryland. We want them to come to Maryland. We want those of them who are native Marylanders to want to stay in Maryland and build their careers here. And this is, uh, again, it, it's a very small bill from a fiscal perspective. It's a, a small but necessary and reasonable thing we can do to help these folks. I would note that uh, Senator Elfrith is the, the sponsor in the Senate. The bill has already passed the Senate, is my understanding, unanimously in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, and we think that uh, it would be a great thing for our active duty military. We have so many bills this year to help them. This is, this is a very small thing and a very reasonable thing we can do to, to help them with our uh, vehicle excise tax titling policy. Thank you. Lynn Nash for two minutes, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chairman Atterbury and dis distinguished members of the House Ways and Means Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in favor of Get Buckles bill. My name is Captain Lynn Nash. I'm a 30 year veteran who served in both the Army and the US Public Health Service. And as a result, I moved more times than I care to remember. And yes, moving vehicles is part of the whole issue. I'm here today as the communications director for the Maryland Military Coalition and as the director representing 1,200 active duty and retired public health officers living in Maryland. The Maryland Coalition supports this bill in relation to its relatively small population in our country. Maryland has one of the highest, if not highest numbers of military and uniform service bases, posts and facilities in the nation, which contribute a significant portion, over 15% to Maryland's economy. Our active duty men and women and their families are an essential element of this dynamic. This bill would authorize an exemption of excise tax to our active duty population, an indication that our state supports them and has their backs. The coalition is a registered nonprofit, nonpartisan organization representing 19 military connected organizations with 150,000 members, including currently serving National Guard and Reserves veterans, retirees, families, caretakers, and survivors. We recommend a favorable report on HB 497 vehicle excise tax exemption. And we thank Delegate Buckle, thanks for your continued leadership in sponsoring this measure and supporting service members and their families. Thank you. Next, Lisa Thompas for two minutes, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lisa Thompas, and I first would like to thank the Ways and Means Committee uh, to allow me to testify on H. Bill 497. I am representing the Maryland Vehicle Titling Association as vice chair. I'm also a licensed title agent, have been for more than 12 years, and is a retired military veteran with over 22 years of service. The Maryland, the Maryland Vehicle Title Association, known as the MVTA, is a nonprofit organization that represents 100 private title service agents, licensees of the Motor Vehicle Administration. Uh, title service agents are located throughout the state of Maryland, and we provide essential vehicle title uh, registration activities for Maryland residents and business, businesses. Uh, overall mission, um, basically is to facilitate and exchange ideas amongst its members, encourage sound business policies, provide industry education to its members, foster constructive progressive motor vehicle title agent le legislation, and to promote confidence, respect, and good fellowship in the motor vehicle title agent industry. And as title service, service agents, we frequently service 
uh, members of the military that seek our title and registration services. And we experienced their frustration when we informed them of the ex excise tax obligation upon returning to Maryland from active duty or coming to a new duty assignment. And they have to pay the difference in tax rates between Maryland and another jurisdiction. The frequent relocation of military members can create a financial burden. Uh, H -Bill, H House Bill 497 helps to ease this relocation stress when Maryland is their new residence or coming back to their home. Virginia does provide excess, excise tax, tax exemption to their members of the military. Thomas, so, I'll have to ask you to wrap up your testimony, please. Okay, so I will just, HB uh, 497 does honor uh, proud members of the military with this important excise tax credit that's rightfully deserved for our serving our country and choose to make Maryland our home. So we just ask for a favorable report for HB 497. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for the bill sponsor or any of the witnesses? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 497. Moving on to Delegate McKay, who has been waiting patiently for House Bill 508. And there are two witnesses after him that will be testifying as well. Well, thank you and good afternoon, uh, Chair Atterbury, Vice Chair Washington, and members of the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, my name is Delegate Mike McKay, and I'm here to present House Bill 508, Property Tax Constant Yield Rate notification requirement. As you can see behind me, this actually is a property tax uh, notice um, um, uh, blown up out of the Cumberland Times News. And really what it talks about is the word increase here. And then we've highlighted it. It's kind of a little bit hard to see, but really all we've done is highlighted the word increase. So as a former Allegheny County Commissioner, I have firsthand experience dealing with the public each year over property tax calculations and the process spelled out by the Annotated Code of Maryland. Now this bill simply inserts the word change and deletes the word increases from the notification required by state law. In our public meetings and after the notification was in a local newspaper, we would have citizens confused during uh, the notification requirement. Having people upset and worked up over the semantics or some arbitrary calculations is certainly not good government, period. Now this bill does not hide or mislead in any way. The public with this word uh, insertion Unfortunately, the current notice is not as transparent as possible. If a property tax rate is changed or remains the same, the word increase must be used on the public notice. But if you actually lower the rate, the word increase must be used. As a county commissioner, we lowered our rate for four years straight but we were required by the state to say that we were raising the rate, which to be perfectly honest, was a lie. We owe who we represent to make sure that we are as transparent as possible to the notice to the public. I urge a favorable report for House Bill 508. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Kevin Canale, please, for two minutes. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman and members of the committee. Kevin Canale here on behalf of the Maryland Association of Counties in support of House Bill 508. I think Delegate McKay did a great job of explaining this bill, especially as a former county commissioner. I think he understands that, that the constant yield law is antiquated, inefficient, and confusing for our, our shared constituents, for taxpayers. And I think this bill certainly provides just a more efficient, accurate, and transparent overview of local to policy decisions based on local tax rates. So just by making this small change, 
we do think this is a really positive step in the right direction. And it eliminates a lot of the consternation from taxpayers when they see this giant ad in the paper that says notice of tax increase. I think notice of tax change is a more accurate depiction of, of what often happens uh, with the constant yield. So I think this just eliminates a lot of confusion. It does improve government transparency and accountability by actually telling people what's going on. And I, again, just this small change goes a long way to make necessary and, necessary and timely changes. I also will note, I mean, there are a lot of protections in place to make sure people understand what's happening. This doesn't eliminate the requirement that we publish the notice. It just makes it easier. It's the right thing to do. It, it eliminates a lot of confusion. And we, we urge the committee to please give a favorable report for House Bill 508. Again, it is the, a step in the right direction to address a lot of the confusion that takes place when people see the, the big ad that says we're raising taxes. Justin Fiore for two minutes, please. Yes, good afternoon, Madam Chair, committee members. My name is Justin Fiore here on behalf of Maryland Municipal League in support of House Bill 508. Uh, similar to our stance on Delegate Smith's House Bill 445, I wanna point out that the constant yield notices in their current form are harmful to the relationship between local governments and their residents. Whatever good it was they were intended for has taken a backseat to frustration. Uh, but this bill will at least help with some of the confusion. Uh, for reasons of fairness and clarity and to prevent further harm to our relationships, uh, we request a favorable report. Thank you. I see two questions, Delegate Lukey and then Delegate Buckle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Canale, Mr. Fiore, um, so I, I have some questions. So, because uh, this is a confusing area of code. So walk me through this. Y your county or municipality um, experiences um, an increase in property tax assessments, right? So the constant yield tax rate law, it, it, would it be correct to say then, I have to provide notice by paying for ads in the newspaper, telling people that their taxes are going up, even if the rates staying the same are going down in order to, uh, the, the constant yield is the constant yield of revenue? That, that's correct, Delegate. So if assessments go up, so if your property value increases, which I think is good for you as a homeowner, the county's collecting revenue just because of assessments. So you don't even touch the rate, or you may even lower the rate. You still have to provide that notice that says taxes are increasing in big, bold font. And everybody thinks that you're actually raising their tax rate when that's not what you're doing. Okay, well, that that's dumb. And I think um, Delegate McKay has a point. But I'm also curious, so the the constant yield is the yield in nominal dollars of current revenues. Does that account at all for the inflation in, in cost of the services provided by localities? It does not. So we're experiencing around a 7% inflation rate right now. And I, I'm sure the inflation rate's a little bit different for government services than it is in the CPI. But essentially, we're going to be telling Marylanders we're increasing their taxes, but really what we'll be doing is reducing the amount of money that localities can have to provide the same set of services they were providing. I agree with your sentiment. Yeah, that seems dumb also. I, thank you very much. Delegate Buckle, then Delegate Feldmark. <clears throat> so, uh, Mr. Canale, I guess um, we've had several bills. I have a bill that relates to this general topic. I think Delegate Smith perhaps had a bill a week or so ago. That, this seems to be floating around a lot. I got to be honest with you. I'm less concerned about the local elected official who has to explain her or himself to their constituent who says, you, you said you raised my taxes. If you can't explain to them, I didn't raise your taxes. Your taxes went up because that valued your property higher. It's, it's, it's an assessment issue. I have less concern about them, the elected officials, than what I do about the taxpayer. And what I'd like to see us get to, and I'd like to get the benefit of your thoughts on behalf of your organization. Couldn't we change all of this and put it in plain, simple English that says, look, we have not raised, we either have raised or we haven't raised or we've lowered the tax rate. The, the, the per unit uh, tax rate. Your individual tax bill may increase even though we have not raised or we have lowered the tax rate based upon your individual property assessment, which is determined by the State Department of Assessments and Taxation. As a result, our 
aggregate taxes, our aggregate property taxes accruing to county X or city Y may in fact go up, even though we have not changed the rate at which we tax our citizens. Couldn't we write that? I mean, pretty much the same way I said it with a few bells and flourishes, but not a lot of legalistic bells and flourishes that anybody with a you know ninth grade reading level could read that and understand my tax rate isn't going up. My locality is increasing, increasing my taxes, but my individual taxes may go up if my assessment goes up and our entire community, our entire jurisdiction is actually getting more money because of those assessments. Wouldn't that be the most fair way? Could, couldn't MAKO support that as the most fair way for both the elected official, that that's honest, and for the taxpayer that they really could understand it? Absolutely. I think we've, we've, we've raised this issue over the years and we've not been able to, to break through the current language. And I, I agree with you 100%. I mean, we should be telling people what's actually going on. And I think this bill, as I said, is a step in the right direction. It doesn't go all the way, but there's been a lot of resistance to changing the legalese that is currently required in that advertisement. So we'd be very much on board with clarifying and actually telling people what's happening instead of getting rid of this this language that no one understands. Yeah, I mean, I like going to the plain English version. And, and as a taxpayer, I could come back to my county council person, commissioner, whomever, and say, hey, you, my taxes went up. You could have reduced them potentially by lowering the rate. And then at least you have that discussion. But, I, you know, I, I share, I mean, I certainly live in the same county as Delegate McKay. I know exactly what he's talking about. I, you know, it's unfair for people to say you raised my taxes when in fact I didn't, your assessment did, I had the power to maybe keep them the same, but I would have had to do a lot of financial machinations to make that happen. That's an honest conversation, which is what we should be striving for. We got to get past this formulaic uh, uh, language that's never going to explain it to everybody. Thank you. Couldn't agree more. Madam Chair. Yes, I can't see who that is. Oh, sorry. That's me with uh, MML on that subject, if I may. Sure. Yeah, Justin, absolutely. I'm interested in your guys' thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Delegate. I wonder here if we've got an opportunity for ESTAT to provide some of that in their assessment notice, which is, hey, as, you know, on behalf of the state, we are valuing your property higher. You may see an increase in your property taxes as a result, rather than put the onus on local government who's doing the same thing, or as Delegate McKay mentioned, maybe even lowering the rate and then having to put out said notice. Delegate Feldmark and then Delegate Long. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess I've got a, a couple questions. Um, you know, this is an issue, having worked previously as a county council administrator, I was responsible for placing these ads and scheduling the special hearing on, you know, the, the increase that is not an increase. And it is confusing and misleading. And I guess, my, my first question is, other than trying to call it a tax increase when the, the rate is staying the same, does the constant yield tax rate serve any purpose? Like, it, it seems like this rate we calculate is only for the purposes of this notification and special hearing. Um, so I'm wondering if this is about clarifying the notice or do we just repeal it? I'm, I'm not sure what benefit it provides. So, so whoever can speak I'll to that. say, I, I mean, I know this law has been in effect for a long, long time. And you, if you read any of the history, this law was meant as a service to the taxpayer and certainly can understand that you want people to know what's happening. You want them to understand what's going on with, with their taxes. But, but I agree with you. And I think uh, my colleague, Justin from MML mentioned earlier that this has now become something way more than it was ever intended to do. And the fact that it's just confusing and no one can read that notice and, and come away saying, wow, I really, I really understand what's happening here. And this provides me clarity. It just provides more confusion. So, in that respect, I think maybe there are opportunities to, to take a look at 
the, the purpose of the constant yield notification and whether or not it's actually serving that purpose anymore. And we're certainly not asking to, to be less transparent, but maybe there's a different way to notify homeowners of exactly what's going on instead of this you know, ridiculous advertisement that people do not understand. And if, if I may, Madam Chair, just one more piece. So if our if the main purpose is to notify taxpayers and help them understand, wouldn't it make more sense since we have direct communication with taxpayers when we send out the assessment? I mean, that that does seem like a um, a more effective tool for reaching every taxpayer rather than a newspaper ad, which people may or may not see. And if they see it, it's just going to confuse them. So, I mean, what would, what would be the potential downside of shifting this notice to an insert with the assessment as opposed to the, the publication and public hearing? I'll defer to, to my colleague at MML. I think he raised that idea. So I, I don't know if Justin wants to take that one. I'm, I'm not currently aware of a downside. I, I'm happy to have that conversation with the committee. Agree. You know, the history, but uh, I'm, I don't see one from my time here at MML in the past five years. Okay. Thank you. As, as the sponsor of the bill, if you just eliminated it as well, I would be fine with that. Just my two cents. Delegate Long. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've been trying to, I've explained this to a lot of people. Uh, it's, it's kind of difficult to understand. Um, the bottom line is the constant yield rate, the county sets the constant yield rate. They use that in order to um, meet their budget needs. They can actually lower the constant yield rate because of tax assessment going up and keep the property taxes at an even level, or they can raise the constant yield rate because assessed values didn't go up. The constant yield rate in Baltimore County is set by the county council uh, to meet their budgetary needs. Um, I agree, we need to uh, have plain language that's either publicized in a newspaper or in an insert with a property tax bill that explains to people that your property tax assessment, if it goes up, um, you know, your property taxes, your, your, the big portion of your property taxes is from the county or the local jurisdiction. Um, you know, we need to be transparent, that's for sure, because I get the same questions. You know, Bob, why is my taxes keep going up? I mean, um, we need to figure out a way to be more transparent. And, um, you know, I, like I say, we need to have truth in taxing. Thank you. Questions for the bill sponsor or the witnesses? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 508, House Bill 619. Delegate Maggione, and there are two witnesses uh, that will follow you for two minutes each. So, Delegate, whenever you are ready. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you uh, to all the members of the committee. And I present I'm Delegate Nino Mangione for the record. And today, with House Bill 619, of course, in hopes of a favorable vote, um, House Bill 619 was presented last year and was also cross filed last year by Senator West. It was unanimously voted out um, last session in the Baltimore County delegation. Um, including a letter of support from Chairman Pat Young, of the, the delegation chair. Um, we've also have an amendment for the record to make this, again, a Baltimore County only bill. Um, so for those, uh, just a brief bill or um, rehash the bill, what it does, it uh, requires Baltimore County's Board of Election to establish separate precincts at certain continuing care retirement communities to serve the specific retirement community. There are 12 called CCRCs in our county and would be their choice if they'd like to opt in. And it would impose three conditions on the establishment of a polling place at a CCRC. Number one, the CCRC must make the polling place available without charge to the local election board. Number two, the polling place in the CCRC must meet all applicable requirements for a polling place under the state election code and regulations issued by the state board of elections. And number three, the CCRC must provide assistance to the local election board in recruiting election judges from among the residents of the CCRC 
to staff the polling place. And this is important because, well, a CCRC, the, the residents are elderly, but remain very active. And this is why we chose CCRCs and not nursing homes or assisted living facilities where residents are more infirm and much less likely to be able to handle, as we know, the physical tax and duties of manning polling places all day. Um, just a little personal note with four CCRCs in my district, I've spoken uh, firsthand with a number of the seniors who are very active, as we all know, in civic engagement. Um, these CCRCs host a number of political forums throughout the year in our district. Um, a lot of these individuals really do prefer to vote in person, especially obviously as their seniors getting older and the difficult travel barriers. And of course, you never know how weather can be around election time. Um, so voting can be a serious challenge to seniors. And we hope that we can make this a little easier, keep them as a part of the electoral process the way they prefer to do it, which is again, many in person. And one example is Broadmead, which is a retirement community right down the street from where I live. Um, it is a licensed CCRC in my district, which has a polling place located inside the facility. And most of their residents, because of this, they vote in person. And my hope uh, is that we can have more CCRCs making it more convenient for their residents. And as we all know, we're very well familiar in this committee that time and time again over the years, this body has passed legislation to remove voting barriers uh, to voting in Maryland. And this would be an important one, of course, to help with our seniors. And on a side note, I believe I'll let him speak for himself, but that uh, Mr. Canale from MACO is going to withdraw the opposition knowing that it is local bill only. Um, and Baltimore County is not in opposition as well. And as I mentioned before, that we had a unanimous vote out of the Baltimore County delegation last session and a very minimal cost to this bill that has a maximum benefit uh, in Baltimore County to our civically engaged seniors. So thank you, Madam Chair. With that, um, I urge or hope for a favorable review and take any questions. Thank you. Next, Kevin Canale, please, for two minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I appreciate Delegate Mangione making this a, a local bill. And if amended to be a local bill, Miko would have no position on this legislation and would withdraw our opposition. Catherine Berry, please, for two minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee again, for the record, my name is Catherine Berry representing the Maryland Association of Election Officials. I just wanted to speak with information about instituting um, continuing care retirement community polling places. We had a unique experience in 2020 where um, our continuing uh, retirement, co continuing care retirement communities were not willing to open up their centers due to COVID. Um, so before we moved to having vote centers in the primary election, there were some local boards who were struggling to identify what we were going to do with those voters that normally would have a facility in their county, or I mean, in their um, a, a, a polling place in their community to vote at. And um, this also started to shift some of the trends. And of course, in 2020, we saw more voters voting by mail in these continuing care retirement communities. And um, with that ongoing shift also, we have the nursing home and assisted living facility program that's part of the absentee ballot program established by the State Board of Elections. So we work with those facilities to ensure that all voters have the ability to cast a ballot um, by, by mail. In addition, just for some factual purposes, in Baltimore County, they are estimating that it's going to cost approximately $20,000 to open a small polling place. And in Carroll County, we have a couple of small polling places. The one polling place is just under 500 voters. And the cost estimate is approximately $5.99 per voter. And likewise, in a large polling place in Carroll County of 8,000 voters, it costs approximately 80 cents per voter with having something larger, so that more vote center concept. Um, in addition, we have challenges with ordering additional equipment, um, that usually equipment has to be ordered nine to 12 months in advance. And then there is limited amounts of warehouse space at some of the local boards of elections. So um, that is all the information I was going to provide today, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I see Delegate Long and then Delegate Eversall. 
Sorry, Madam Chair, I didn't put my hand down. Okay, no problem. Delegate Ebersol and then Delegate Wilkins. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I think it's a question for the sponsor. Um, so you were gonna go with the statewide bill um, and have decided to go with Baltimore County, which is, you know, that would burden Baltimore County alone and not other counties in the state with, according to the numbers I heard, what could be as much as a quarter million dollar uh, budget increase. Uh, they have to come out of other parts of their budget. I'm wondering, as someone who is getting a little older and who lives in Baltimore County, is Baltimore County treating its old people bad when it comes to voting worse than other parts of the state? Why are we targeting Baltimore County? Am I in danger here? I don't think you're that old, are you? No. Uh, well, thanks, I, but yeah. <laughs> no, well, thank you, Delegate. And I don't know if we, the word target would be uh, what we're trying to do by trying to make it easier for senior citizens to vote. I don't know if that's a, any way type of targeting them, um, making their lives easier and more accessible voting for the seniors, I think is what the goal is here. That's what I was, um, it was brought to my attention with the, by these seniors that I spoke with. I know that Senator West, who's tried, uh, I think two or three times with this bill. I, I don't think it's meant at all. It specifically was, we chose to do it in this in the county, um, first and foremost, because there are a good handful of CCRC specifically in my district. And as any of us delegates, if a number of especially seniors come to you and ask you for something, I thought it was a reasonable uh, request. And that's um, that's the main reason that we put this bill in. So, Chair, could I just clarify? I don't think maybe my question. Let me try again. Why Baltimore County? Why seniors? Why? Why aren't we? I'm sure there are CCRCs across the state. So why would you choose only Baltimore County to, to bear the burden of this new and what you're saying is exciting access? So we say, again, bear the burden if we're going to be a test site. Yeah, for that's not my question about the burden. My question is why Baltimore County? Well, I represent parts as you, Baltimore County, and I looked at it as a potential positive for the county. And if it makes it easier to pass by doing it local, and then we see if it's a, a, success, a successful program, then maybe the state can take notice. But if that's going to help um, just kind of get it going in, in, in our county, that's why I chose to, to avoid um, some of the issues in terms of if, if people are against it in other counties, then they can be against it. Why do we have any Baltimore County bill uh, specifically to our county? I thought it was a good start for Baltimore County and something I think a lot of the residents that I spoke with and the CCRCs were in agreement in terms, they were the ones who asked me to do it. So I just thought if that's the best way to go forward or make it easier to get it through, and that's what I, uh, why I did it for just the county. But this, the whole entire state is more than welcome if uh, other delegates from around the state want to back the proposal in their counties. You could do it. Thank is. you, Madam Chair. Thank Delegate you. Wilkins, then Delegate Guyton. Thank you, and thanks so much, uh, Delegate, for bringing this bill. Um, we certainly want to ensure that um, there's greater access to voting for everyone. I just wanted to confirm a few things related to the bill. Is in the bill, is this a mandate on the voting site, or is it a suggestion? Is more of a suggestion. They do not have to do this. The CCRCs do not have to. It all, it all depends on whether they want to or not. So no, it's not saying every CCRC will be a, a voting site if they opt out. But they're required. the The board is required though to adopt to um, ensure that a CRC is a early voting site. Is there any requirement here that the board has to take to identify this as a voting site? There should not be. I, mean, I can look back in the text, or we can certainly look to amend that. To just, it was supposed to be enabling legislation. This was all supposed to be whether or not the CCRC would want to do that. Um, and that was that's the intention of the bill. And if, if the text needs to be altered, that's certainly. I thought that was how it was written in the text, but uh, that's my mistake. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. I just also wanted to check, since you're changing this to be a uh, delegation um, legislation is where are we in terms of conversation with delegation and a delegation letter and support and all of that. Just wanted to check. Um, thank you, Doug. We were working on that. We sent uh, to our chairman to, to uh, make sure we're allowed to present it as we do with our local bills. Uh, so we're working on getting that on the delegation schedule. So hopefully if it's like last year, we can get out of with unanimous support and we'll have the uh, a letter like we did last year. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Dylan. Also, just a couple other quick things. Have you, so this sounds like it's something that your 
local board is able to do on their own. Have you had conversations with your, with your local board about them just going ahead and designating um, this as a voting site? So last year we had just a little bit of a back and forth, but no, we'll, and that is something that we'll, we'll double check. I'll make a note uh, to see what they're, what, if anything, we can already do um, to get it done with them. Okay. If we don't um, need would... to, then we don't need to, but no, I haven't. The last uh, conversation with the local board was a brief email, um, I think sometime last year, right before we adjourned, so. Yeah, it, it would be really helpful to get a sense of their position because this can just avoid the entire legislative process on our end because this is something they would be able to designate just on their own. Um, and just a final question from you. Are you aware of um, any other place in the state where the legislature specifically um, mandates for a county any specific um, polling locations? Now, I'm not aware of that, but I was, wait, I'm sorry, it, did you say that again? I was just wondering if you are aware of any other county in the state where us as a legislature mandates specific polling locations. Well, I don't know the answer offhand to that, but I know us as a legislator mandate or made rules to make it without going into all the details, for example, uh, having for those incarcerated to get certain mail-in material and stuff like that. So this is simply, I mean, it may not happen anywhere else, but I'm saying we should be able to make it happen now. That's the whole point. I think that I'm looking at it as mm -hmm. something new that we're trying. Uh, maybe just because we haven't done it before, I don't think necessarily, in my opinion, makes it not worth to explore and hopefully get done. Okay. So. No, thank you, Dahlia. Let's uh, definitely follow up. I totally get what you're, you're trying to do here and appreciate you fighting for seniors in your community. Um, the As a general rule, we don't mandate specific polling locations. We have general guidelines on what must be taken into consideration, but um, perhaps whether it's your local state board or another way that we can find, maybe we can get to what you're trying to get to. Thank you. And I do appreciate that. Thank you, Dylan. Okay, Guyton, then Delegate Feldmark. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and thank you, Delegate Mangiani, for bringing this. Yeah, we did pass this last year. I do believe that the bill was a little bit different when it passed delegation than what you're presenting today. So I, I would just look at those discrepancies because of amendments. Um, my question to you, actually, uh, though we did vote for it last year in delegation, after that time, I was contacted by MACRO, which is the association that, that um, actually represents those continuing care associate, uh, retirement associations. Um, and, uh, and they were not in favor of the bill. So I'm, I'm hoping that since that time, you've actually had conversations with that organization and uh, have their support. Can you uh, elaborate on that? Well, I will have to go back with Macro because uh, the last letter I had from last year was in support. So if they changed their mind, um, I will have to get that from them. It would have been nice. Um, that's very nice they reached out to you if they're against it. I will appreciate it if they reach out to me. I'm sure they have a representative on here. Um, that sure, and, and if I'm wrong case, about that, right. I apologize if I'm if I'm mis if I'm not remembering that correctly. But I know that we had calls from uh, from those folks abroad, Meet who run that organization uh, about this bill. So I just think just make sure is is all I'm asking. Yep, I appreciate that. And Thanks. as we said before. Uh, they would not have to. So if Broadmead did not want, well, I'm sorry, Broadmead, we Broadmead if somebody not. else, if, if somebody else did not uh, want to uh, mm -hmm. be a CCRC with a voting place, then they would not have to. So, right. but no, thank you. I appreciate that. I will reach out to Macro yeah. and was it uh, Barber, I believe, right? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Delegate Feldmark. Thank you, Madam okay. Chair. Um, so um, I, I guess my question really has to do with the, the addition of extra precinct uh, polling locations, right? And you've said in the bill that if, 
if one of these communities wants to have a polling site, they have to meet the standards set out by the Board of Elections. Um, would they also have to be willing to serve as a polling site for the entire precinct in which they're located? Or are you thinking this would have to be a polling site specifically exclusively for the residents of that community? So I would be willing to, to absolutely if they make it where the surrounding area could vote there as well. And I understand the concerns earlier about COVID and obviously that's a, a legitimate concern, especially right now as the young, the, I don't know her name, so I can't say, but uh, I, we totally understand that, but making it a voting location for these, the CCRC and the surrounding area, um, we see no reason why that couldn't be something we could accomplish. Okay, so that could be one of the standards that the board set. So instead of creating an additional site, they might be moving the polling site. Yes, yeah. That, okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other, other questions? Delegate Hornberger. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, maybe a, uh, a model that you may want to look at, uh, Delegate Mangione, is that uh, this committee actually worked very diligently to get drop boxes uh, installed in our prison systems uh, for those, for those uh, inmates that are eligible to vote, however, are currently incarcerated. And um, also a, a designee that can go there and help facilitate them with the filling out of ballots, et cetera. Is that something that uh, you might be amicable to in these uh, similar situated in, ter in terms of folks that are residents uh, that may have mobility issues, they can't leave the facility, but still want to participate in the electoral system? That, and that's certainly an idea that might make it much easier so they can literally go down. And uh, that's an idea I have not thought about, but yeah, they could, the senior citizen could walk their vote to the box. So yeah, that, that could be something to explore as uh as, as I mentioned before, many of them we've talked to like to make sure their vote is in person, uh, whether it means going in the box, at least they get the hand deliver it there, um, which again, that was kind of part of the, the speech, you're right, is making it accessible and easier, especially for seniors, um, okay. since we've done it with so many other groups. All right, yeah, I'll, I'll take another look at that legislation and get that over to you as maybe an amendment. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 619. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. House Bill 629, Delegate Plakovich Carr, and there are two witnesses coming after you. So whenever you're ready, Delegate. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, colleagues. For the record, I'm Delegate Julie Plakovich Carr here to present House Bill 629. This legislation would allow voters to use smartphones and other electronic devices while um, voting at a polling place under certain conditions. So state law is currently silent on this issue. However, since the year 2000, there have been regulations in place in Maryland that prohibit a voter from using an electronic device while in a polling place. But fast forward to today, we know that smartphones are very ubiquitous in our society, and there are plenty of legitimate and non-disruptive ways that a voter may want to or in fact need to use their device while voting. Um, for example, a voter may have used their phone to record information on how they want to vote and need to reference that information while they are in the voting booth. Voters may need to look up information to inform their decision on how to vote, such as looking at a voter's guide or news articles or a candidate's website. Someone who's registering to vote at the polls needs to provide proof of residency, um, for instance, a utility bill. But at this point, many people only receive electronic copies of their utility bills. And a convenient way to show that would be to show that bill on their phone. Some voters need language translation services, and there are apps like Google Translate and others that are easy to use and free. And finally, some voters with vision problems use their phones to magnify font, um, for instance, on a ballot so that they can read it. But none of these uses are currently allowed in Maryland. However, 34 states plus the District of Columbia allow voters to use their smartphones in polling places for these types of activities. And this bill seeks to do the same here in Maryland. The second part of the bill addresses ballot selfies. A ballot selfie is when a voter takes a picture of themselves while voting. And for many voters, this is just a display of their enthusiasm um, about voting or perhaps even who they voted for. And they wanna share that with other people. And that um, you know, is, is something that they're choosing to do. And that kind of grassroots outreach through social media could actually uh, motivate other people to vote as well. 
28 other states plus DC allow voters to take a picture of themselves with their completed ballot, but Maryland does not. And this is um, potentially pretty problematic because our current regulations may be a violation of the First Amendment right to free speech. When other states have restricted the ability of voters to engage in free political speech, even on security grounds, courts have interceded. Specifically laws in Indiana and New Hampshire that prohibited ballot selfies have been struck down by courts. And in both cases, fears about the potential for vote buying schemes were not deemed sufficient justification to limit free political speech. And as the First Circuit Court of Appeals colorfully noted in their ruling against the state of New Hampshire's um, prohibition on ballot selfies, they said that preventing vote buying by banning ballot selfies is like burning down the house to roast the pig. Um, moreover, our current regulations really um, create a very disparate set of rules for voters depending on where they are casting their vote. So the current regulations only apply to polling locations. That means someone who is completing a mail-in ballot at home is not subject to those regulations. And in fact, is actually free to use their smartphone or computer to look up information while they're filling out their ballot. And in fact, can even take a picture of themselves and their completed ballot and share that. And they are not running afoul of the current regulations. Yet voters who are at a polling place cannot do those same things. And so that just means that the current rules really are inconsistent and confusing for voters. Finally, I do want to note that the informational testimony um, submitted for this hearing from several organizations does raise some legitimate concerns about ballot selfies, especially for the potential for harassment of election judges. Um, while I have included a number of protections in the legislation, um, given the current political climate, I can understand the hesitancy to, to act in that area and to make changes to the system. Um, I do think in the long term, we do risk having someone bring a lawsuit against the state and perhaps the courts deciding this issue for us if we don't with legislation at some time before then. But at a minimum, I would ask that the committee um, can act to bring Maryland into the 21st century by allowing voters to access information on their phones while they're voting in a polling place. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Philip Wilk for two minutes, please. Hey, thank you very much for letting me uh, address you all. Um, I can't really add anything uh, to, to that um, excellent description of the situation, but I can describe to you what happened to me in particular. Um, so this was a, a few years ago, and during an election, I went to my local polling place uh, with my infant child. It was in a stroller, and um, I had carefully saved all my, uh, my notes on how I wanted to vote on my phone and uh, in a notepad app. And uh, when I got there, I was effectively unable to vote because they wouldn't let me access my phone, which was kind of strange compared to that they do this inconsistently. Um, I've been able to use the phone before in the past, but this one time they decided to enforce the rule, which I understand now to be a law. Um, so I was, uh, I was pretty upset at the time because I carefully planned my visit around my work and my kids, and I've got really young kids. So I wasn't able to return and I was unable to vote because of this. And, it, and it's pretty upsetting. <clears throat> so I do think it's about time to bring Maryland into the 21st century and more align with uh, the other states in the nation. So if I can use my phone at home to vote by mail, I should be able to do it at the polling place. So thank you very much for letting me speak to you. Next, Catherine Berry, please, for two minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. Again, for the record, Catherine Berry representing the Maryland Association of Election Officials. Um, we would like to thank Delegate Polakovich Carr for bringing this bill to the committee. Um, I think our biggest concern is just being able to execute the law and give appropriate training to our election judges to be able to manage um, what people are using their phones for. I know from personal experience, sometimes the election judges have come in and you know we tell them that voters are not allowed to be on their cell phones and, and the election judge say, well, I am not the cell phone police. And they just get very uncomfortable when you have to address those types of issues with voters. Um, so we also don't want to get into a circumstance where people are being recorded without their knowledge um, and, and kind of violating people's privacy. But we also can appreciate uh, the selfies. We do have instances in some local boards that have established selfie stations at early voting centers. So we have used them in the past and they're outside of the voting rooms. But we um, 
we would like to explore maybe updating the State Board of Elections regulations and to see how other states have implemented these things and then reflect them accordingly. So we would like to continue to work with the bill sponsor on um, how best to implement this um, idea. So thank you. I'll get Hornberger with a question. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Definitely uh, respect and accept the, the goals of the bill, but one of my concerns is, you know, when we were, you know, we were much younger and our parents used to take us to the voting booth. It was, you go inside, there's this machine and you kind of pull the curtain behind you. And I guess for cost measures, uh, et cetera, we've kind of evolved. And, and now there's just a, a very small paper enclosure that's around you when you vote. Uh, you can't look left or right and see someone else's. But, you know, the nature of someone taking a selfie, generally from above, using a selfie stick, uh, you know, my concern there is that other voters, um, because these things are high resolution cameras and are held at different angles, could could capture uh, someone else's ballot or, or at least uh, make the other person perceive that someone's taking a picture of them voting. And I'd, I'd hate to discourage anyone from wanting to vote, you know, uh, based on that. So, you know, could this accompany a greater uh, privacy for the voter, for the other voters? Uh, wh what are your thoughts on that? Um, thank you, Delegate Hornberger, for the, for the question. Um, I mean, we do say in the bill that, uh, first of all, voters can only take the picture while they're in the voting booth and then um, can't include other people unless they have their consent in the photo. Um, I, I think depending on the setup at a polling station, you're right, some of these places are fairly tight. And um, Ms. Barry's suggestion about having you know, a designated area in the polling location could be a viable path forward. Some other states have done that um, you know, in an area where basically they're, they're ensuring that there's nobody else who's gonna be in the background of the picture. And I think that could be a viable you know, way forward on that issue. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good start um, because you know, there's all sorts of accusations that get floated around during during voting day. So um, uh, thank you for bringing the bill. Are there any other questions for the bill sponsor or anyone here? I have a quick question, uh, Delegate Lakovich Carr. Um, I'm getting pretty good at saying that without fumbling. You are. So. <laughs> Have you seen, um, so I'm somebody that relies on my phone for everything. So, you know, if I had gone in the booth and wanted information and I can see this happening because while we are out campaigning, one of the number one questions you get are about down ballot people, right? Like, so you could go in the, the booth and people want to know who are these people on the board of ed? Who are these, you know, judges? Um, and so I can imagine folks going in there and saying, oh my gosh, you know, they don't have their lit that five million people and now it's COVID are trying to harass them and, and give them and they're trying to figure it out and they want to look it up. Um, so, and the issue of privacy has been brought up, which I personally think you're in a public space. So, I mean, I don't know how much privacy you're entitled to. Um, I get the point about folks taking pictures and, and trying to, to use that in, in a negative way. So my question is more focused on that um, in terms of, you know, trying to get your ballot, um, which I'm not quite sure you know, how that would work since the space is so small, but do you know, or are you aware, has that been a problem in other states that do this? Because you mentioned there are quite a few states that allow this. So have they found an issue um, with privacy um, or, and folks having their picture taken and not wanting that taken and, and that type of thing that's been brought up today? Uh, thank you for the, the question. I haven't seen any formalized evaluations of this in other states. I've looked at what other states have in statute and in regulation and, you know, just looked in the news, just trying to see kind of how this has played out in other places. Um, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there haven't been some specific instances uh, raised around that, but it doesn't seem like writ large there's been major concerns um, from a privacy point of view about how the majority of other states are, are handling this and allowing these photos. Question is for Mr. Damaris, Do, does the Board of Elections have a position on this at all or a statement for informational purposes? Uh, um, I would say for a statement, I mean, if, if it's something where the, the camera is going to be high up, I think at that point there, the judges would probably be uh, able to say that's 
not appropriate because of the angle and stuff. But as long as it's uh, just uh, not affecting others' voters' secrecy and their privacy of their ballot, um, I, I think like the idea of a station or something like that, this is kind of the wave of the future. Phones are attached to everyone's hips. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to continue this discussion and, and try to craft a, a good policy to uh, allow the flexibility needed, but at the same time, uh, understanding that there are some concerns about privacy and ensuring ballot security. Other questions? Delegate Long. You're on mute. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I know this might be, uh, what about uh, with the scanners and everything, could someone possibly have a device that looks like a phone that could actually affect the scanners? I mean, you know, we're talking about uh, voter integrity. Um, I mean, now you can actually have a scanner where you stick your card in and it, it steals your credit card number. So, um, you know, are you concerned that possibly that someone with a phone looking device could actually uh, affect, possibly affect the outcome of a uh, of uh, election? Is that any concern? I'm just curious. So, I mean, I'll say, you know, what we're intending with the legislation is that people can bring in their, their phone or a tablet or something like that to one access information that is on that. Um, you know, I, I believe as we've defined electronic device in the bill, you know, something that possibly could resemble a scanner would not be allowed. Um, I'll say right now though, the regulations are around use of a device not possession. Um, I might defer to the, the state board if they have any more specific technical answers to that. Exactly, Delegate, you kind of, hit, you were gonna, you hit my answer right there, which is, you know, when you go vote in person, you're not surrendering your phone at the, at the with the, the judges to go vote. So uh, I think your, your question about, about using a phone for that purpose, uh, is, I don't think is, uh, I, I would say is, is not necessarily an issue uh, currently or even thought about. Okay, are there any other questions? Yes, Delegate Wilkins. Thank you, sorry, something's wrong with my, my mouse here. I'm trying to, I'm just trying to- <laughs> No problem. <laughs> um, yes, I uh, did wanna ask because I have actually had a situation happen to me at a polling location um, where someone very aggressively came up to me with their phone and started taking pictures of me, trying to accuse me of, of doing something wrong. It was very strange um, and off-putting situation. And so I just wanted to um, learn more from the bill sponsor sort of around how you think this bill can toe the line in terms of intimidation and privacy. You know, someone trying to fill out their ballot, I don't necessarily want to have my ballot end up being captured or encourage people to bring their phones and taking pictures and have other, you know, people kind of caught up in it. Um, versus I do think someone using it for their notes, which lots of, lots of us use our phone for their notes. If you can talk more about how you crafted the bill to sort of weigh different privacy and, and intimidation concerns um, versus some of the practical uses. Uh, thank you, Delegate Wilkins for the, for the question. So the legislation says that a person can only take a picture when they're in the voting booth. They can't take a picture of somebody else without their consent or, or videotape them without their consent. They can't be videoing the equipment in the in the polling place. Um, I believe, or and they can't be making calls or doing something like disruptive with their with their phone. Um, so it's intended that you know they're just you know quietly doing their thing. If they want to take a picture of themselves or even just like of their ballot themselves, I know there's some questions raised about like what would the angle look like. Um, you know, right now, even any of us as like candidates on the upcoming ballot, we can't even take a picture of the ballot with our name on it. Cause how cool is that? That our name's on the ballot, right? Like that's not even allowed right now. Um, so the intention really is to keep this fairly narrow and confined in terms of when a voter could be using their phone and especially using it um, to, you know, make, make recordings or, or um, taking pictures in the polling place. Um, you know, that said, that, as I mentioned in my testimony, I think the concerns around harassment are, are real in the current political climate. Um, I'm certainly open to, you know, with any of the stakeholders and with the committee trying to figure out if there's additional protections that we should be including. 
Um, but I think Ms. Berry's suggestion about having a designated spot might be one solution to that to ensure that there isn't anybody who's accidentally in, included um, in any of these photos. But at the end of the day, I mean, it will come down to enforcement by the election workers, by the poll workers, but that's the system we have now. They already have to enforce if someone's trying to use a device. Um, those election judges are the people who are supposed to be telling folks, no, you can't. Okay, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 629. And to our last bill of the day, House Bill 617, Delegate Lasanti, and there are six witnesses following you that will have two minutes each. So whenever you're ready, Delegate. Thank you, Madam Chair and colleagues of the esteemed Ways and Means Committee, Delegate Marianne Lasanti for the record. It is my privilege to bring to you House Bill 617 for the purpose of clarifying the state law as it pertains to property tax credits for surviving spouses of fallen military service members. This bill is also enabling legislation for local governments to adopt this standard. Under current law, real property tax exemption is authorized for living veterans who are 100% disabled. However, a surviving spouse must meet certain criteria to qualify. A surviving spouse may qualify upon the death of the disabled veteran, however, for those service members killed in action, restrictions are placed upon the tax credit. Among the qualifying criteria, a line of duty surviving spouse must also, must also be a recipient of the dependency and indemnification benefits. In other words, if a fallen service member has named someone else other than their spouse as a beneficiary, the surviving spouse is not eligible for the property tax exemption. Status of, of dependency and indemnification benefits have little to do with common ownership of real property. Maryland law provides tax exemptions for veterans who are 100% disabled, but sets unnecessary burdens for those who have suffered an in line of duty death. The current law is oddly restrictive and left to broad interpretation. The language is confusing and has led to the denial, which to denial of many claims which you will hear about today from my, from my panel. House Bill 617 seeks to adopt the US Code, federal definition of fallen service member, and clarifies and affirms that the surviving spouse is eligible for the same property tax credit, excuse me, tax exemption as a 100% disabled member. Passage of House Bill 617 sends a strong message to our Gold Star families that their sacrifice for our freedom is valued. With that, Madam Chair and members of the committee, I respectfully ask for a favorable report to House Bill 617. Thank you. Next, Amy Siegel, please, for two minutes. Hi, uh, my name is Amy Siegel. I am the surviving spouse of Sergeant First Class Nicholas Siegel, Army, who died in the line of duty on July 21st, 2016. This issue became near and dear to my heart recently last fall when I moved to Harford County and was denied benefits that I had previously been afforded in Stafford County, Virginia. I received a denial letter from the Attorney General's office last fall, which stated that I was not, not eligible for this real estate tax benefit because my husband did not die while living in Harford County and it was also outside of two years from his death. Imagine how surprised I was when I got that news after having been afforded that tax credit in Virginia for the last two and a half years. It was at that time that I met Delegate Lasanti at a Gold Star event on APG, and um, that's largely why we're here today. So thank you, Delegate Lasanti, for um, offering to help me with this. Um, this benefit is, is, is a big deal for gold stars. You know, we've lost our loved ones. And this is a way that the Veterans Association across the country has offered to say thank you and honor our veteran um, and our loved one who is no longer here to help bear the financial burden that we have as a family. Um, in the state of Maryland, it does state that certain gold star spouse or spouses are eligible. Um, 
So I would ask that all surviving gold star spouses or sp spouses of survivors um, who are unmarried are eligible for this benefit. Our families endure an unimaginable loss of amount of heartache and loss when our service members die in service to their country. These laws are in place to provide benefits to help soothe that loss and reduce the financial burden that comes with it. You know, as a as a a person living in um, Harford County, and also my husband actually served here for four and a half years on the tech escort team um, in Edgewood. You know, I feel that I'm being a little slighted and um, not receiving these benefits as a service as, in, in honor of my husband's service. Um, one family member being denied this benefit is too many, in my opinion. In Harford County, we have about 200,000 people the gold star population is a lot less than that. And I feel like this tax credit is not going to be a significant burden on the government here. Um, I, and anything, I feel like Harford County- Eagle, would... Ms. Siegel, I'm gonna to have to ask you to wrap up your testimony. Okay. I'm hoping that we can do the right thing and honor, our, honor the gold star spouses in Maryland, just as they do in Virginia. Thank you. Thank you. Randy Taylor, please, for two minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. I'm Randy Taylor, a recently retired Major General from the U.S. Army after 38 years of service. And one of my more recent responsibilities was as the Senior Commanding General of Aberdeen Proving Ground here in Northeast Maryland. And they're uh, you know, humbled to be, have been responsible for over 28,000 people at APG that were either service members, government civilians, family members, contractors, and also wore another hat where I was responsible for 16,000 people for a command that's uh, worldwide. But out of all of that, uh, my most sacred and important responsibility was caring for the 76 Gold Star spouses that are serviced by every Proving Ground. And throughout my career, I've been responsible for assisting Gold Star spouses in any way possible. But I tell you, my experience at Improving Proving Ground leads me to this testimony today. And as you hear from Gold Star spouses, you'll understand more why. So my experience over the years in the, in the military included many combat arms units, with special operations commands, uh, deployed many times. But my primary responsibility was taking care of soldiers and families. And I knew that if I took care of the soldiers and the families, the soldiers would take care of the mission. And that may be obvious to you, but what may not be obvious is the reason why soldiers fight is not because they hate who's in front of them, but because we love who's behind us. And the reasons to support this bill, I think may be obvious, but there's another effect that I wanna point out that's not so. And that is those service members deployed, the last thing we want them to worry about is will we care for their family members if they're fallen, if, if the soldiers are fallen. And the hardest thing deployed in combat, and I've deployed eight times, is getting a soldier to focus on the fight when he's concerned about what's going to happen with his family member if he doesn't or she doesn't come home. So I urge you to support this uh, for, for those two reasons. And I thank you for your time in the two minutes today. Thank you. Next, Danielle Charles, please, for two minutes. Good afternoon, my name is Danielle Charles. I'm a Gold Star wife in Aberdeen, Maryland. I am the surviving spouse of Senior Airman Gilnor Charles. Um, we lost my husband in January 14th of 2011. At the time, um, we had one child in college, a uh, 17 month old baby and a one month old baby. And it is true that when it comes to our soldiers leaving, we are a family unit and they leave with the understanding that we would be taken care of and that certain benefits are in line with us being taken care of. A lot of times we are left feeling that we are forgotten because most people think that we are taken care of. The truth of the matter is there is a benefit that was given to us, a large lump sum. When I lost my husband, my kids were young. If I did the calculations, that large sum only equal to five years of my husband's income if he never got a raise. We are now in year 11. 
So that just goes to show how much that has extended. But still, when it comes to everyday life, most people leave us out and forget that we're still here. And we are the little bit that it may seem like to someone else, how is this amount going to help us? But every cent counts when you become a single parent, when you go from a two income and your whole life flips and changes, and now you're responsible for everything on your own. This amount will help us tremendously. And not just for my family, for any Gold Star family. We have, we've, and we do feel like we made, our, our spouse made the ultimate sacrifice. And it hurts us that we feel forgotten that we aren't taken care of by our government. Truthfully, and thank you, General Taylor. When General Taylor came here, he made a lot of changes to make it known that we were still here because a lot of people don't even know what Gold Star means. They will say to me, if I say I'm a Gold Star wife, oh, wow, congratulations. It's nothing to be congratulated about. I thank you that you honor us because we lost him, but it's not a position that we choose to be in. This bill will help us do little things for our children that we're struggling to do right now. So I ask on behalf of myself and all Gold Star families, please don't forget our husband's sacrifice. Please don't forget they made a choice to join up and serve for you knowing that and under the, under the understanding that we would be taken care of if something happened to them. Now that thank something- you, Charles, to, thank you. I'm gonna have to ask you to wrap up your testimony. Sure, now that our husbands are not here, please consider fulfilling what they were promised that we would be taken care of. Thank you. Next. Evelyn Jewell, I don't see her in here, but I will call in case I'm not seeing her. Evelyn Jewell. Okay, we'll circle back after I call the last person, Lynn Nash, for two minutes, please. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in favor of Delegate Lasanti's bill, HB 617, property tax credit for surviving houses of fallen service members. My name is Captain Lynn Nash. Again, I'm a 30-year veteran who served in both the Army and the U.S. Public Health Service. I was the first response coordinator for the public health, and as a result, I'm well aware of the challenges that family members face when their service member risks his or her life when deployed. I'm here today as the communications director for the Maryland Military Coalition and as the director representing 1,200 active duty and retired PHS officers living in Maryland. The coalition supports HB 617, especially after my discussion today with Della Lasanti, where I asked her to consider an amendment to her bill to make it more inclusive of all of the uniform services who deploy and die in the line of duty. As written, this bill only addresses the active duty of the military, naval, and air services, that's the six military services, and not all of the uniform services. It excludes the active duty of the NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, who have been known to sail into man-made disasters, such as the air and waters contaminated with radiation during Fukushima to collect much needed data, as well as my service, the Public Health Service, who has for the last two years and continuously deployed to hospitals and clinics around the US fighting COVID. Over 6,000 PHS deployments have taken place, which is essentially all members of the service. Most PHS officers are on a continuous rotation of 30 days deployed and 30 days at home since the start of the pandemic. Several officers have been infected and while serving on the front lines to fight against disease. Therefore, I ask that the bill be amended to include all uniform services who die in the line of duty. I've already told you that the coalition exists. It's 19 military connected organizations with approximately 15 
150,000 members. We support and ask for a favorable report on HB 617 with our recommended amendment. We applaud Delegate Lasanti and thank so much for your call today, um, especially your commitment to the survivors of our fallen heroes. Thanks. Check for Evelyn Jewell one last time here. Okay, um, questions? I see Delegate Patterson has a question. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Delegate. Lasante for bringing this legislation to us and certainly I'm well aware of the Gold Star Wives and Gold Star Families a designation and to, to all of them, we, we honor you. My question is in reading the legislation, sometimes I see the word may and then others shall. Is this uh, in essence enabling legislation for the counties and for the jurisdiction cited? Um, uh, Madam Chair, may I answer? Yes. Okay. It, the um, the shall is for the state law to to broaden the definition so that we 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 um, the the may is the enabling piece for uh, for the local uh, lo local jurisdictions um, if they want to uh, extend this benefit. All right. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. For that. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 617. Thank you all. And that concludes the bill hearings for the Ways and Means Committee today. I will see everyone when we resume tomorrow for bill hearings at 1 p.m. And are there any um, subcommittee announcements for meetings? Uh, local revenues, we will meet tomorrow uh, after bill hearings uh, on two bills. Delegate Wilkins, are you meeting tomorrow? Are you still on here? I see you, Delegate Wilkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Election Law Subcommittee will also meet tomorrow at 11 a.m. Please check your emails for the two bills that we will consider and uh, please review the amendment on one of them. Thank you. Patterson, are you making an announcement or is your hands just still up? Okay. 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 Haley, can you tell me when we're off air, please? Everyone just 